Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Budget Committee on November 17th. Uh, I do have regrets today from Councillor Elgar, who is attending the Niagara Escarpment Commission on behalf of the community uh, today, so he'll be missing uh, from our committee. Uh, do we have any declarations of pecuniary interest, members of the committee? I see none. Very good. Any member of the public wishing to speak further regarding an issue on the 2017 Budget Committee agenda for today may appear before Council at its meeting on December 12th, 2016 at 7 p.m. when the recommendations from this meeting will go forward for final consideration. If you wish to speak as a delegation, please sign the sheet located at the back of the room or notify the Clerk's Department no later than noon the day of the Council meeting. Any PowerPoint presentations must also be forwarded to the Clerk's Department no later than noon the day of the meeting. Uh, members of committee, we have before us a fairly full agenda of, of reports. Uh, we do have a report from our staff going through each of the areas of the town. And Gord Lalonde, I believe you're the one leading us off today. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to present corporate services to you today. Uh, I will be covering off uh, political governance, human resources, financial services, legal services, information services, and facilities and construction ma management. Um, we have done a reorganization in the last year, and bylaw enforcement has moved from corporate services to community development. It was too late for us to adjust our financial reporting systems, so you'll see some ele elements of that uh, department in my uh, notes, and uh, Commissioner Cloacy will cover off pieces of it as well. Uh, 2016 was a very busy year. Uh, we concluded our second by-election of the term. Uh, we concluded two collective agreements, one for QP 1329 and one for QP 136, and we had a clean audit as usual. Um, the acquisition of the Legacy Hospital site has turned out to be a much more significant undertaking than any of us would have originally estimated. And um, our stabilization reserves at the end of 2016 are in good shape and within the GFOA's recommended <clears throat> best practices. I'll be talking about this one a little bit more um, later on because it's in two phases, but we have almost concluded stage one of the strategic asset management um, plan. This is for three asset classes. Uh, we've concluded it for land, or we are concluding it for land improvement, road networks, and environ networks. And we're going to be starting on phase two next year when we will cover off the remaining classes, building fleet, equipment, and communications and technology. <clears throat> These are legislated requirements that we have undertaken over the past year and will continue into next year. Um, partly to prepare us to apply for funding from the provincial government, which requires that you have an asset management strategy. We put two new major systems in place, uh, the ITS, our uh, Intelligent Transport Transit System, and the library catalog was automated or uh, was redeployed this year. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about RFID um, later on in my presentation. We are using a new approach. Uh, to the development of the new Oakville Arena and the relocation of Fire Hall 3. IPD uh, is a, a system that was originally developed to try and avoid litigation at the end of large construction projects. It, was, uh, it has been used fairly extensively in the U.S., but not so much in Canada, although there have been some fairly significant pro programs done with it. We traveled to St. Jerome's College to investigate how they were using IPD, and um, uh, they concluded a $40 million uh, student residence uh, within budget and on time. And uh, now we have become the center of attention across Canada for municipal IPD projects. Uh, we're being watched and questioned fairly closely about the techniques we're using, which so far has been quite positive and successful for the most part. Uh, you'll be aware that we just recently concluded our ward boundary review and have submitted our recommendations to council. That was, I guess, approved at, at council uh, on Monday night. And our bylaw search engine is much more than just replacement of old technology. The bylaw search engine was deployed on 25-year-old technology. It was on its last legs. We had to replace it. And in replacing it, we decided to do something a little bit new and different. So what I presented to you here is uh, 
as an, as an example, uh, it's bylaw number 22. Uh, you can see that it was passed in December of 1857, and it was to build a lockup. Um, and the reason that I chose that is because they extended the funding over three years to build, to build the lockup, $1,200, $400 a year. Um, the first bylaw uh, that, was, uh, that was passed by the town of Oakville was on July 9th, uh, 1857, and that was to provide a fund for education. The second bylaw passed on July 27th, 1857, um, was uh, uh, to prohibit public bathing in view of private residences. Since been repealed. And the um, third bylaw was to provide for the sale of spiritus liquids. And that was passed on July 27th, 1857. And I think there's kind of a nice symmetry to those, those bylaws. They went a couple of months and then they passed a, a bylaw to build a jail. <clears throat> this graph is probably um, our commission's major key performance outcome. Um, what we're doing in this slide is we're measuring our performance against the corporation as a whole. I think it's a fairly important um, comparison because in corporate services, I think it's really important for us to be vigilant that our costs are not increasing against the overall corporation. So you can see that um, our relationship with the corporation is fairly flat. You know, we are um, a fairly steady percentage of organizational expenses. And I'll come back to this later on. Um, if you go through the detailed slides and try and compare these percentages to some of the detailed pie charts later on, it won't match precisely because we backed some of the costs out, such as transfers to reserves and things, so that we can make a more accurate, um, a more accurate comparison. So it doesn't quite match, but it is in accordance with our KPI standard gathering system. I've picked a, a smattering of key performance indicators. Um, as I said, the first one is the most important to us, but some other ones um, are um, meetings held in open session. And um, uh, this has declined over the last year because of um, two cl closed sessions for solicitor client privilege. Um, an important and up and coming one, well, you can see our leads program is our training programs and uh, they are well received by the organization and um, we seem to be um, generating a feeling that people are learning things when they go to these courses. Um, the full life of assets, this will become more important as we move into our asset management strategy. What we are trying to do there is maximize the use of assets to 100% of their lives. And there's many reasons why you would take an asset out of service before it reaches its end of life, but our goal is to try and increase that number every year, and if we are successful, when I come back next year, you will see that number climbing from 77.9 to something over 80%, I hope. We had a clean audit as usual, and um, while our network availability seems to be stalled, it's because we've been making our measures more stringent as we have, have moved forward. So if we use the same measures as last year, we would have climbed a little bit, but we're making them more stringent. I think we're stabilized now, and we will, uh, we will carry on with those. Our key initiatives for next year, uh, for 2017, will be the completion of phase one of the strategic asset management system, and we will be kicking off stage two. This will be a major milestone in moving the organization towards decision-making based on data, priority, and risk of assets. This will initiate a whole life asset replacement strategy and life cycle maintenance within a corporate framework. This is a very, very, very important program. The, DT, the DC background study uh, will be uh, uh, will involve extensive amounts of coordination and integration with several, several departments. And uh, as we mentioned at the kickoff meeting, we'll be coming back to council several times throughout the year. Uh, the pr preparation of the 2018 budget and related forecasts promises to be very challenging. As our CAO mentioned in his opening remarks, I don't think we're going to find an easy route to the target. We're going to have to work hard to get there. Uh, we will be replacing end-of-life software. Our CRM, Customer Relationship Management System, is already underway. We're evaluating replacements for the system that we have. Um, our recreation systems are being studied right now, and I'll come back to that towards the end. 
Um, and major system changes like this are significant for the information systems department because they have to lead the charge in putting them in. But they also affect the whole corporation as business processes usually change when you put in a new system. Uh, clerks will be launching a new electronic agenda management system. Um, that system is at its end of life and this will come as no surprise, but we are improving our mobile, um, our mobile presence with a product called Diligent Boards. Um, which will be coming online early in January, and I think some of you have signed up to, uh, to, to try, the, try the test case out. Whoops, sorry. Carrying on with 2017 key objectives, um, our legal department will be busy with, Glen, with the Glen Abbey file, with the General Electric site, and with Simgen file. Human Resources is in the process right now of implementing an attendance support system this will be partly supported by a new electronic employee self-service system that will allow us to book online leave requests, vacation requests, and so on. A fairly new, well, not new development, but a development worth watching is our cash in lieu calculations are often now making their way into OMB appeals. So that will put an additional burden on um, realty services and the legal department. The um, Trafalgar Park revitalization, which is basically the rebuilding of the Oakville Arena and the move of Fire Hall 3 from its current site over to the corner of Kerr and Rebecca Street um, will be a significant challenge. Uh, both, of, uh, both of these are, <coughs> are, that will be going on at the same time as we're doing the demolition for Oakville Trafalgar uh, Memorial Hospital, which is also quite a massive project. And those two projects together are going to strain the capacity of um, our facilities and construction management. Um, the establishment of the Municipal Development Corporation will be going forward next year, um, along with the initiation of sales of parts of the public work site. And we are launching a town people plan, which is a human resource plan, which will be looking at managing the capacity and effectiveness of the organization, uh, developing organizational capacity and engagement, and leadership development. Uh, this is a slide that depicts our um, gross operating budget versus our net operating budget. Our gross costs are offset by um, uh, licensing fees and some fees related to uh, taxes, but by and large our commission is not very able to uh, offset expenses with, with revenues. Most of the services we provide are to the other departments of the, of the town. Uh, our gross operating budget broken down by expense. You can see that our expenses are based uh, in personal services, which uh, account for about 71% of our, our budget. Uh, the rest is really very small by comparison. In here, you can see the breakdown of the departments by gross and by net operating costs. And um, our information systems is our largest operating cost, uh, followed by... Um, financial services, and then sort of spread fairly evenly across increasingly diminishing cost areas. This slide represents the raw increases supported by the tax levy. The largest increase is in information services. Nancy mentioned this in her opening remarks, and this is mainly due to software maintenance and software as a service. These costs are increasing in some cases by as much as 30%. Uh, the software as a service increase costs because you have to pay for it on a monthly or an annual basis. You can't buy a package and then decide to just not update it. And when you purchase it as a service, you, you have to pay a, an ongoing subscription fee. Um, the largest percentage increase was actually in regulatory services, but because it's such a small department, a modest increase makes it look like it's really going up a lot. Uh, this side details what the cost drivers are for us, but I'd like to go back and draw your attention to the way our costs map against the corporation. So in the previous slide, those are the raw numbers, so 3.58, 3.62 million, and so on. Um, and you can do the arithmetic and see what the changes are. Um, in this one, I want to take a slightly different approach and talk about how um, 
our departments are mapping up against the corporation as a whole. So political governance, if you map it against the corporation, and I, I might add, these are all included in your budget book. So if you turn to the tab for the relevant area and you turn to the KPIs, this is all documented in there. Um, political governance actually decreased when compared to the rest of the corporation. It covers the mayor and council and secretariat, council and committee services, elections, print and mail services. And the major drivers to change in this area are when we have an election. The election costs are smoothed out because in the years that we do not have elections, we deposit money in a reserve. And in the years when we do have an election, we take money out of the reserve so that it doesn't make a big hit on our tax, our tax levy. But um, we're not expecting an election next year, so costs are pretty stable. Uh, when compared with the corporation, the IS budget, which you could see in raw numbers in the last slide, has increased by about $800,000 had a budget increase of about 0.2% against the corporation and a full-time increase at about 0.2%. So I, I information system is growing faster than the corporation. The major drivers <coughs> of change here, as I said, were mainly regarding software and software as a service. Uh, but I would like to point out to you, as I have in other years, the philosophy we followed in the corporation is to map all of the IS costs and expenses into the IS department. So in some areas you would see those dispersed throughout the operating units. Our feeling is it's, it's much better and much cleaner to track them all in one place. So those costs all roll back into IS. So if we upgrade um, you class and the maintenance fees go up because we've upgraded class. That's reflected in the, in the information systems budget. Financial services, uh, ongoing efficiencies have helped to avoid increases in staffing costs as the corporation has grown. Um, we did the budget book this year is automated for the, for the first time. It's cut down on a lot of the time that we put into making that budget book, which is still a very significant experience. We have a 0.1% increase against the corporate budget that's in, um, in, in budget, and that's matched by a 0.1% decrease in our full-time equivalency complement. The operating budget for FCM has remained stable against the overall corporation for both budgets and FTEs. The legal budget has not changed at all against the corporation, although the number of FTEs in legal has increased by 0.1%. And this is mainly due to conversion of uh, part-time uh, staff to uh, full-time staff. And regulatory services, as I said earlier, they had the largest percentage increase, but when you measure them against the overall corporation, they've actually gone down a little bit. Oh, hmm. That's the problem with sending your slides in a little bit early. I had removed internet voting and ranked balloting after last council meeting, um, so they shouldn't be there, but um, if we were gonna go down that path, that would have been a complex challenge. So our complex challenges are increasing complexity. Uh, we've got increasingly complex legal files, increasingly complex really transactions, and I've put in the new ward and councillors because next year we will be in full swing in election preparation. So that will mean changes to the voting lists and selection of new uh, voting locations and so on. So um, our extra ward um, will mean some, some uh, added complexity to the election process. Under fiscal, process, under fiscal pressures, I've listed um, operating costs for new facilities. So as we build new facilities such as uh, the Southeast Community Center, they will need to be staffed and um, you know, council's guidelines on this are very clear. So um, we will be uh, working hard to bring next year's budget in within the uh, guidelines of inflation that we have received. The strategic asset management policy um, will change the way that we look at how to replace our assets uh, we don't know what the outcome of that will be at this point, but it will be a data-based outcome. We will have analytic decision-making to help us with that. And the DC background study is going to be complicated. Um, under new approaches, I, I listed the town people plan. Uh, that will be our, our new HR strategic plan, which is being initiated with our attendance management, um, our attendance support program. Um, there are a number of end-of-life systems coming up. Um, it, it really is um, uh, something that's well beyond our control, but it's a significant issue to have things like 
a class, the CRM, um, our uh, uh, agenda reporting system all come to end of life in the, in the same year and uh, we will be uh, dealing with that. And um, we have um, the impending digital strategy which we will be bringing back to council in the new year, but we'll also change the way that we approach uh, our projects and project development. Keep going the wrong way. Key drivers of the capital budget, so I'm into the capital budget now. Key drivers will be the development charges background studies, a replacement of end of life systems. Um, I've already mentioned the customer relationship management and the recreation system. Uh, departmental service efficiency enhancements, such as ILS, ITS, and the library we're putting in RFID, there's just a lot of efficiencies coming through the systems at this point. Uh, here, um, I'm presenting to you the 2017 capital plan for corporate initiatives. Um, um, the corporate initiatives that we'll be undertaking is the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. Um, FCM has conducted various studies including preparation of contract documents for demolition. Demolition is scheduled to start in 2017 and may take 8 to 12 months depending on the methods of deconstruction. The second project listed here is, um, oh, is the um, Southeast Community Centre. This, uh, the third project, the um, town's current CRM has advised that it will be discontinuing support. So uh, we will be implementing a replacement in 2017 for Service Oakville and um, its partner divisions. I've already talked about the asset management. Um, uh, the digital st um, uh, st strategy has been uh, deferred by council. Um, so in accordance with that, uh, we will not be uh, taking any funds from that capital budget until it's approved by council or w when and if it is approved by council. If I go to the next slide. Oh. The 2017 to 26, this is the 10 year capital plan and what you'll see there is the numbers for the various projects peak up a little bit because most of these projects are spread over more than one year. So you'll see them in next year and then if they continue on to 2018 and so on, the numbers, the numbers increase. Corporate services, the major projects are um, town hall accommodation. Um, renovations are designed to extend the town's um, space or extend the number of people that we can put into the town space and maximize usability. Next year, we're going to be moving staff out of the portable and using the portable or, or using the portable in preparation for the election. <coughs> um, the second project is the replacement of site works at town facilities, including walkways, driveways, um, parking lots, and other elements that are at end of life. Um, the third is hardware evergreening. In hardware evergreening, um, it's used to upgrade infrastructure such as PCs and telephones and printers. Uh, PCs are upgraded every five to six years. This is up quite a bit. And originally we replaced PCs about every three years, but the quality of the technology has improved such that we can delay that and improve them every five or six years. Um, we replace about 200 machines a year from the PC fleet. Uh, printers and monitors last about seven years, telephones about 10 years and so on. So that's a cycle that we replace those things in. Energy management of large buildings is used to perform energy management retrofits to town buildings with a focus on projects with a short payback. So when we improve a, a heater or an air conditioner, we expect there'll be enough energy systems, energy savings to recoup that expense at some point. Um, as I mentioned already, the town CRM system is at the end of, the end of life. Uh, the continuation of document management in, uh, in the corporate document management, this is a very large program that is just kind of moving along. So I thought I'd give an example. In 2016, Information Systems started working with the Building Services Department to scan all paper-based street files into Amanda. Um, <clears throat> and they'll be stored there as file attachments. So it will mean easier access for people and a reduction of uh, storage space. If the digital strategy is approved, one of the further steps that we would take with that is to make it available through the web 
which would um, help us to reduce the some 800 or so freedom of information requests that come into the building department to display these street files. So we would put them online and then ultimately you would be able to look up your own files instead of having to file a FOI request, which we think would bring substantial savings all around. And um, the last project is to extend the town's fiber network. Um, for about 25 years, uh, IS and traffic have been sharing fiber cables. So whenever we put in a set of traffic lights and run a digital, a digital cable to that, some of those fibers are uh, used by traffic and some of them have been used by information systems. And this, I think, has been a very strategic pro program. As I said, 25 years in the making. Uh, but what that means is we do not have to pay network charges to companies like um, Kojiko or Rogers to connect our buildings. They're connected over our private fiber. So connecting buildings is tens of thousands of dollars a month. And we do it on the back of the fiber that we've been installing over the last 25 years or so. And not only are we saving money, but we are, have very, very enhanced service to these facilities, much better than uh, you would experience in most other uh, locations. So that's the last of those projects. This gives it within a 10-year context, but it's all pretty much the same as I, as I said. Uh, there's little to be gained by presenting each of these in detail. And I did promise to answer the question on shared IS services. So this is a more complete list than I could come up with off the top of my head the other day. So Microsoft um, licensing software and support, Oracle, Rogers Mobility, PCs, monitors, and laptops, and um, uh, servers network and, and um, wireless components all come in under provincial um, purchases. So we piggyback on the back of the province as do many other um, municipalities. And an example of the benefit here is if you buy a, um, if you buy a Rogers uh, phone contract as a public person, you probably pay about 80 bucks a month for it. Uh, the best we could do when we were doing our own negotiation is we got that down to about 65 bucks. And then when we, um, when we tied in with the Provincial Purchasing Initiative, the price dropped to $20.25 per, per phone. So these have really significant uh, benefits to us. And um, we evaluate them very carefully against what can we do for ourselves, because in spite of those order of magnitude improvements, sometimes we can do better. The next five, um, the public purchasing saw bonfire, printer toner, long distance charges, the GIS orthophoto, um, uh, this is a project management software, Eclipse. Uh, those were all uh, covered off through the Halton purchasing agreement. So the municipalities of Halton have a joint buying um, group and we can do much better uh, by purchasing as five municipalities as opposed to purchasing as four municipalities. The um, fire dispatch software, that was initiated probably about 10 or 12 years ago, might even be 15, where we joined the dispatch uh, units for uh, Burlington Fire with um, the town of Oakville, and we have evaluated that several times over the years to make sure that we continue to enjoy less costs for uh, software infrastructure than if we did it ourselves and that's proved itself repeatedly. And then um, just a little bit more detail, I think I did mention this, but Oakville, the IS and Recreation Departments, um, Recreation Culture Departments are participating with Mississauga, London, Toronto, Brampton, Burlington, and Hamilton in evaluating new recreation and culture registration systems. So there are a few more, but they're sort of more of the same. So uh, that's what IS is doing to um, amalgamate its efforts. And that concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Very good. I've got a, a set of questions from Councillor Robinson to start. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Lalonde, what, uh, what will a, a, DC, a DC background study look like, and what will it do for us? Well, the development charges um, bylaw is what we um, charge developers as yeah. an ante to develop in the town. Yeah, That's no. based on a very rigorous set of studies that project how many and what magnitude of facilities do we need. So there will be an estimate of what kinds of fire facilities, additional fire facilities do we need as the town builds out in North Oakville. As the town grows in North Oakville, 
what additional recreation facilities, library facilities do we need? Um, what additional roads? Transportation will be a very, very important part of this, of this study. Um, so all of those things come together and then we take forward uh, a DC bylaw which will be coming forward uh, for as a bylaw in 2018 but all the preparatory work is based on all of these master planning initiatives and um, that's the evidence that we use to substantiate the DC study that we make public and eventually turn into a bylaw. It's heavily tested. Uh, we will be working with uh, the development community and um, in many cases the development community litigates it so by the time we get through the process it's a very thoroughly tested set of numbers that that you know reflect the reality of what's going to happen in the next is the community other than the development community entitled to be involved well it's a it's a fairly public process yeah. so so we do bring those reports to council. Uh, there's a subcommittee of council that has been established, yeah. and um, that can be attended by um, whoever, whoever cares to attend it. The processes themselves, the studies themselves, are generally highly technical, and um, they involve initiating something and then waiting for it to come back, and then we would present it to council. How long does this take? It's going to take us at least the full year. I imagine we'll still be working on it in early 2018 in preparation for presentation, I think in March, in March of 2018. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, other members of the committee? Very good. Uh, Councilor Liz Chenna? Oh. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so you had indicated that the Oakville Arena is going through the integrated project delivery system. Yes. And then for the um, Corporate initiatives, uh, you indicated about the Southeast Community Center, the design about the 1.2 million. Is that also going to be an IPD project? So is that, is that starting out with it, or is that going to join in after? We anticipate that it will be done by IPD. The IPD model is a really interesting model. What it does is it causes all of the participants in the process to come together. So in a, typical, um, in a typical construction project, you would take your drawings to the, um, or you would take your plan, the architect would drop the plans, that would be concluded. Then you would uh, get a general contractor and you would go through that process and then you would hire in trades and sub-trades as the project progresses. The problem is that um, every time, so, so for example, let's say, um, you've had the drywaller in, the drywaller comes in, drywalls the building, and then you realize, uh-oh, there's something wrong with the air conditioning. So what has to happen is the drywall has to come down, the air conditioning has to get fixed, and then the drywall has to go up, back up, and you get beat up by change orders. The, the, the way the IPD model works is everybody agrees on the model. So a large part of it is um, subcontractors and the general contractor and the architect um, second-guessing all of the planning and saying you can't do it this way because I have to do this for my particular part. By the end of the validation phase you will have a very solid estimate of what the costs of the project will be. And then those costs, we know the profit that the, we know the, profit that the subs are going to take out of that and if there are change orders or if there are uh, cost overruns, that comes out of the profit. So the, the, the amount that we are budgeting is, is a final number. And um, the second part of it is that we assume, we believe, that the budgeted number is much better than we could have got in the other system. Uh, change orders can often account for significant overruns in, in projects. So, as I said, um, we think that the project has gone pretty well. It's uh, been a learning experience. We do have uh, areas where we can improve and get better. But overall, and by and large, I'd say it's worked out very well for the Oakville Arena and the fire station. And we anticipate starting the OT, the Oakville, the South Central Community Center using the, using the same system. So the amount of 1.2, is that already part of that? 
the, the IPD or getting everybody together? Yes, yes, oh, that, yes. that will okay. be start. That's starting the process. Very good. Thank you. It's a longer run up to the project when you do it by IPD. Okay. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Um, My ears perked up, uh, Commissioner Lalonde, when you talked about um, the Oakville Memorial Hospital deconstruction or demolition at uh, $7.6 million. That seems exorbitantly high for a demolition. Could you comment on, on that? It's a very big building. Um, I, I hesitate to say how big it is. I keep on mixing up my numbers. The, um, the building, though, is extensive, it's three stories, it will have a significant hazardous material removal approach because it was built in the 1950s. There's elements of machinery in the machine room of Oakville Memorial Hospital that I'm pretty sure were built in 1952 that they were nev never able to take out because they got crammed in uh, too tightly. Um, there's millions of cubic feet of uh, concrete that have to be taken out. There's millions of cu cubic feet of fill that have to be put back in. Um, so yes, it is a very large amount, but I believe those estimates are what it will cost to take down a building of that magnitude. Thanks, Commissioner. Just one other question, and, and maybe staff can answer to this one. Uh, the key drivers of, um, and I'm, I'm familiar with this way back when with the recreation uh, registration system, which was, I think it's still called IRIS. Uh, however, we're looking at an, uh, a new provider. Uh, is that a total changeover now we do business today? Too early to say. Uh, we're evaluating all solutions. Uh, that class software was, was sold to a company called Active um, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, active, um, active sort of had a different business model than class. Um, the municipalities, the large municipalities were uh, content with class in the early days and then became more discontent. The active model followed uh, sort of a smaller organizational model. So it would be used by high schools and, and uh, communities and so on. Um, so um, you know, Active has recently made it clear to us that they want to change their model to become more attractive to, to municipalities again, and uh, we are evaluating that option against all the other options. So I can't rule them out or rule them in, um, but uh, they are playing. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Listerna again. Just one more quick question. Um, regarding stabilization reserves, the 21% for 2016, is that a good number? Well, I mean, what number would be ideal? I mean, I guess it's a, it's a very high, good. but is that? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get Nancy to answer okay. that because she's going to tell you about so many months of. Okay, so thank you. I appreciate that. Through you, Mr. Chair, 21% is a very good number. Uh, GFOA, Government Finance Officers, recommends about two months or 17% of gross expenditure. So we are exceeding that. That's a good thing. That gives us that cushion that we need for severe events or, or anything that might arise. Any others? Okay, I have a couple of questions I'll bring up. Uh, one question that was brought up earlier. Um, could staff report on the cost of the Let's Talk Oakville newsletters and could staff report on the cost of the Civic Track license uh, that are within the council uh, budgets? Sure. And, Absolutely. Um, and I suspect there might be uh, an interest in uh, providing alternatives to, to those, whether to keep them, not keep them, or do something else with them. We'll be, we'll be bringing a, a report forward with a number of appendices um, shortly, and we'll include that in there. Thank you. Uh, could, uh, so within, the, uh, it's not just your section, your commission, and this is uh, for all the commissions, but it's an, an HR question. Could staff provide a summary report on the salary and benefits changes that are happening across the organization. So we have multiple unions involved and we have uh, non-union staff as well. Could staff identify uh, where we stand with each of those categories of staff? Sure, we could make a chart up that would lay out the different groupings and the, 
and the scales. And, and where we're able uh, to indicate where we will be going with those groups over the next couple of years? Yeah, sure. We, it, well, most Depending of them, on where we are with them, because each group is a different group. Yeah, right? there, there are a couple of union, like the fire uh, contract, we still haven't got a final word on that, so we won't be able to include that in, but we do have some baselines that we know, and um, transit is coming up for renegotiation, I think in 2018. Uh, somebody said, eight, yeah, yeah. So 2018, but uh, QPs are. Um, we've got you know number of years, almost three years still to go in though, so we can do that. Thank you. Um, there was a question about um, FTE and our staffing levels. We have in the uh, in Appendix One, we have the schedule full-time equivalent complement. Could staff clearly identify? Um, how what the actual number of employees are uh, and and how they add up because we've got uh, for example the first page identifies full-time restated then part-time restated and then totals um, I'm thinking we, I'm thinking we could give you the number of t4s that we um, um, provide so we know how many full-time people there are and then the FTEs get converted I'm sorry the part-time people get converted into FTEs so sometimes it's two people, and sometimes it's three. That's what you're getting at. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a quite, yeah. Yes, there's a question about that, um, but there's also a. I think there's some confusion about um, uh, which numbers are. Uh, we've got a, a full-time restated number of 1193 in one place, and then we've got a restated uh, continuous full-time positions of 1192 on the next page, for example. So there's a little bit of. Um, Definitional question? We, well, maybe, and we maybe will, it's really just a question of can we have a glossary of terms? We, cool we'll, we'll clarify that. Thank you. Um, on the uh, appendix to the uh, schedule of uh, projected outstanding debt principle that we have, could staff separate out the LED uh, project from the, the roads list? Uh, yes, we can. I thought there was a slide on that in there. So the LED. In, on page 337 of the book, we have the projected outstanding debt principle. And we have buried in the roads category, the LED project. Can we separate out the LED project so that we can view it as its own category? Sure. Because, because it's being, I'll call it internally financed uh, through the savings, I think it's important to be able to have that discussion. And that's, um, that's all I have for you right now. Okay, thank you. So are there any other questions? Very good. Uh, then I think we're on to Commissioner Bell? No. Commissioner no. Closey. Commissioner Closey. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to present the uh, Community Development uh, Commission presentation for uh, the 2017 budget. You'll see on this slide the programs that are within the Community Development Commission. As um, uh, Council, uh, Commissioner Lalonde had indicated, uh, with the recent switch of municipal enforcement, it does not show as actually one of the programs within the Commission. Um, that is included in the regulatory component, which I think Commissioner Lalonde had spoken to. Uh, so I won't speak to any of the financial issues or the financial components of the municipal enforcement. I will, though, speak to the initiatives, uh, particularly in 2017. So in terms of the accomplishments in 2016, we had begun the official plan review in 2016. Um, and most prominently, I've highlighted three of those studies that are ongoing at this point in time. Uh, the Urban Structure Report, which um, has just gone through some public uh, meetings through this week and next week, and has been the subject of a background study at the Livable Oakville Subcommittee. The Employment Commercial Study, which identifies how much employment commercial lands we need in the future and what should be the policies around those two uses. A background study has just been completed by the consultant, which will in part begin to shape and form our policies going forward on those particular areas. We have also been doing a fair amount of uh, consultation around the Main Street areas, that's the downtown, uh, Kerr Street, 
and the Bronte area. Uh, in the spring of 2016, we had done some consultation for these areas, and we hope to bring back to the Liverpool Oakville subcommittee uh, the directions that we are going to be recommending based on that consultation. We've also spent a fair amount of time defending Liverpool Oakville over 2016. We hope by 2017 that will have finished, and this is in relation to the in zone. Uh, Liverpool Oakville is a plan that is already in place, but the implementing components of it are through the zoning bylaw. So out of the 80 appeals we began with, I think we have about 21 appeals left, um, and those will be sorted out through 2017. We expect them to be finished. On the environmental side, we have our stormwater master plan. Uh, it has been ongoing throughout 2016. Uh, we expect it to come forward to you in about April of 2017, so it's nearing completion. Uh, there was a public meeting held on that, I think it was in June of uh, 2016. And of course the private tree bylaw in coordination with uh, Parks and Open Space and Development Engineering, that was brought forward to Council actually fairly recently. Uh, the climate change strategy uh, reached milestone five. Uh, we're one of two communities throughout Canada who reached, has reached that milestone. So we're certainly leaders on the, on the climate change front and we've been recognized that by that with ICLEI. <clears throat> the Health Protection Air Quality Bylaw has been in place for quite some time and we, that uh, whole uh, focus of that bylaw was to implement over time. Uh, and we've just finished, I think there is one, I know there's one major emitter that's left. They're still doing some uh, work and we hope that that work will be finished in 2017 so that we will have all of our companies in compliance with our Health Protection Air Quality Bylaw. The Health Oriented Mixed Use Node is a quite an exciting project. Um, it's the 30 acres that are to the east of the hospital site. Uh, the uh, council approved parameters that would guide how that development project would go forward. And we've just recently received a resubmission from the applicant based on the parameters that council had set out and approved. I think it was in the spring. On the cultural side, we have the downtown cultural hub. Not a lot happened in 2016 on the downtown cultural hub. We've been doing a fair amount of work with the Polaro survey, trying to understand what is the uh, community as a whole, the whole town's um, opinions, uh, points of views on the cultural hub. Um, so that work will be coming forward. You have a report actually um, was on November the 1st and has been deferred to November the 28th on the downtown cultural hub, setting up what our next phases and next steps in that process. And the last one I'll mention under the cultural is the Cultural Heritage Landscape Review. This was a review that was started in 2015, I believe. Uh, in 2016, at the very early part, you saw the phase one of that study come forward. Uh, and now we've been working through those eight priority properties that, that were identified in that first phase to determine how should we treat them in terms of their cultural heritage attributes. So I have these lists of uh, 2016 accomplishments. In terms of the outstanding services to our residents, there has been a number of uh, pieces that we've moved forward, not all in place, but should be uh, in the earlier part of 2017. The single permit solution is putting together a group of permits that deal with uh, what happens uh, when you do a, a project. These would have been permits that would have been through site alteration. There could be some parks and open space permits. There could be some temporary parking permits. All of them associated with the development. We're com combining them all into one single permit. You can use online services. You'll be able to track that application as it moves through the process. So it sure, certainly should streamline the process and provide much better service to our residents. Our online information enhancements we've continued to make. Uh, last year we had brought in the uh, mapping that showed you could research the building permits, committee of adjustment permits. The uh, piece that we've done this year is on the coyote. If you haven't looked at that, that's quite an interesting tracking of the coyote activity. Um, and so we'll continue in 2017 to make quite a few improvements. Site alteration permits you'll see come online as well, as well as other uh, permit activities. The temporary on-street parking permits was a much easier way for the public to get a temporary on-site on-street permit. It's all online, it's much easier to use, and I think we've gotten fairly favorable response from the implementation of that online service. In terms of good governance, uh, the traffic calming program uh, was adopted by council, and there is some further information in my presentation on that because many of, much of that was referred to the budget committee. 
the College Park Area Transportation Study was completed, and many of the projects that came out of that you now see uh, throughout the 10-year capital plan. And of course, the Lakeshore Road and 16 Mile Creek uh, Bridge Rehabilitation Project has been a major initiative. Uh, the engineering work will be done uh, and will be moving into construction in 2017. Council had also endorsed the Municipal Enforcement Strategy, which moves us from the current program that we have. Uh, in 2017, it would move us into a, an after-hours call service, and then by 2019 into a 24-7 enforcement service. So it's quite a, a change in the level of service we'd provide the residents and businesses in the town. And the last one is our rates and fees review. Uh, we have been at a rates and fees review for quite some time on our development applications. That's our building, our development engineering, and our planning applications. Uh, we have a new model in place. Uh, we were able this year to tweak the model, um, and it has actually worked very well through our development engineering permits. We still have more work to do on the planning side, which I'll speak to a little bit later. So when you look at the key program outcomes, uh, this is the one I thought would give you an indication at a commission level uh, what is our, our outcome. Uh, looking at the, the commission, I think out of the, uh, um, I'm just trying to find my page. We as our commission rely about 17% of our expenses on the tax levy. So the bulk of our um, uh, expenses are covered through our revenue. What this chart is trying to show you is the blue line, which is actually what we do recover, a percentage of what we recover. The red line is our actual recovery. So I'll give you some examples. In building department, we anticipate that we should be cover, recovering 100% of the cost of building services. Uh, and you'll see because uh, they take up so many of our, our revenue, uh, they actually drive the line in this particular case. Uh, the uh, development engineering department would pick up about uh, 75 to 80 percent of their cost would be cost recovery and the planning department runs around 50 to 60 percent. So you can see that over the last 10 years uh, we've been able to recover more of our costs uh, over time and that is particularly I think driven by the building department and development engineering where we've been actually able to uh, recover our fees or reflect our actual costs and our fees. There is still some issues with planning. Uh, planning is a difficult one to uh, project because if one application doesn't come in, uh, it can drastically change the way in which you've recovered. And I think the way in which they, you charge for applications is much different. For example, in the building department, you charge one fee for the whole service. And then your, your fee, one cost for the entire service you can recover through a variety of fees. Whereas in the planning department, you have to actually recover for that specific application. So if someone files an official plan amendment, you actually have to track what it costs you to live, deliver on that particular application, which when you have multiple applications coming in on one particular site is sometimes a challenge to do, which we've found has been the case. So this, um, I have the same chart broken down by each of the program areas, but I thought this would give an overall commission picture of the ability for us to recover our costs. I also took a smattering of uh, key uh, program outcomes from each of the program areas. So in terms of our energy co uh, consumption, we don't have the information in for 2016. We are making some headway uh, in this area. And we've invested uh, quite a bit into our buildings in so that it gives us a much better ability to measure that. And I'll speak to that in our capital program as well. Our um, uh, fine particular matter, the measurement of the PM 2.5, which is very much what our health protection and air quality bylaw was driven at uh, protecting, has, we haven't seen a consistent uh, decline in that. This is uh, influenced by many factors not just the, the element, the, the single element that we can regulate through our health protection bylaw, but it is one we are monitoring in terms of community measures. Our percentage of uh, uh, pavement, deficient pavements within the network, this is the program that our resurfacing is driven at. And uh, I think we've done about 24 kilometers this year. I think you've recently seen an email that came out from Dan Cozy our director of engineering and construction, that we were able to actually look at more roads. And we are doing a uh, survey in order to understand what's been the um, 
impact on the residents in those areas that we have done it. Um, so that's been quite a positive program this year. You will see that the number increases to uh, uh, 9 percent. Uh, that was anticipated um, and I think we've hit the, the, the peak of that and will be uh, coming down in that uh, percentage. The last one is the kilometers of uh, sidewalk per thousand. Uh, this is an ISO standard that we measure against. We only have two years of data at this point in time, but over time it is increasing and we'll have to see how the next several years go. These were some of the community measures I had pulled out. I pulled out some service delivery measures in terms of the time frames it takes us to process permits. The first one is relative to the building department and the time frame it takes them to process uh, a 10-day permit. 10-day permits are usually ones that are for single-family homes. It's projected at about 11 days. The only ones that are tracked in this category are the applications that actually come in as complete. So if they're a complete application, we track them and measure them. About 50% of our applications actually meet this target. But I think you probably have heard, I know we have, <coughs> excuse me, that the uh, average turnaround time of our building permits um, is running about four to six weeks at this point in time. Certainly volume has impacted that. Uh, changes in the building code have meant that the uh, types of applications that we're getting submitted are quite deficient in terms of their requirements or standards. Both at a staff level, we're dealing with the new building code, as well as the builders out there, particularly as John Tudor tells me on the HVAC system, uh, we're quite often getting in deficient information. We also have been dealing with two building, two zoning bylaws for the last year, so that has made the review times um, less um, efficient. Uh, so that at this point in time, our time frames are uh, uh, of an issue and certainly the volume of applications coming in have also Im impacted that. You'll see in the capital budget uh, program that we're looking at doing a building services review, which would review building services from stem to stern, uh, look at ways in which we can improve the overall uh, services and time frame of that but also provide more online services so people can monitor better their applications. We get better an data analytics so we can really understand where we need to fine tune the overall system. In terms of planning applications, uh, we have about 53% um, uh, of them, which is a decline, coming in within the statutory time frames. I think this is a reflection of the number of applications have dropped and the applications that we currently have in in 2016 are not your straightforward applications. They're quite complicated. Um, they take in, because we're moving more into the intensification areas, they're much more complica complicated applications to deal with, a lot of community involvement. Um, so our time frames with a limited number that have come in have been uh, decreasing, increasing time frames not meeting our statutory. In terms of our permit applications, we're pretty well staying on par. Uh, there's been a slight dip, uh, but at the same time, volumes have substantially increased. So we, we have a mandated time frame of four to, six percent, four to six weeks, and we've been generally meeting that in 67% of the time. Although single permit implementation in April of 2016 should considerably change that number, and we'll see in 2017 whether that's occurred. In 2017, moving into next year, we have our official plan review that will be ongoing. We have our urban structure uh, report that we'll be uh, working on and concluding in 2017 or early 2018. We'll be moving, as you saw in 2016, we're more focused on our Main Street areas. We'll be moving into our larger intensification areas, so that's Uptown, Palermo, and Midtown. And we'll also be beginning a community character analysis, so it's really trying to take our zoning bylaw and official plan policies more down to reflect the community attributes on a finer, uh, more granular level than we currently have within our end zone. We have the Glen Abbey application, which Gord had noted as the ICB appeal that will be coming up in uh, January, the end of January 2017. Uh, but we also have an economic study underway, and of course an application has just been submitted on that site. Transportation master plan will be underway. This is in support of the development charges bylaw. It's quite a complicated master plan this year in terms of accurately anticipating uh, the various modes that we should be um, reflecting in the, this master plan. And then of course, each of us, uh, each of us being each of the commissions have a part in the former hospital site. 
Uh, Gord had spoken specifically to the demolition. We'll be looking more at the overall development of the site and the opportunities and community services will have certainly a big role in terms of the community center itself. We should be moving into the Brantwood implementation in 2017. Uh, Council had given us direction on this site quite some time ago. We've done a fair amount of work understanding what the market potential is, uh, what substances are actually in the building, so now we know uh, what we can do with the building to move out to uh, request for um, proposals on that site. On the environmental side, you'll see the stormwater plan come to a conclusion in about April of 2017. We're also looking at an enhanced site plan process so what we're finding, particularly with the impacts of, of climate change and the uh, uh, denser development within the uh, existing area, and I mean, I'm talking about the foot coverage uh, of buildings, uh, the drainage is not as flexible in the southern part of Oakville that really needs to be understood through a site plan process. So we're looking at expanding site plan to include some of those areas in particular to look at drainage and stormwater issues. In coordination with Parks and Open Space, we're going to be looking at North Oakville and the Urban Forest Management Plan to see how our targets that we had set are being applied and whether or not we're meeting the uh, requirements from that plan. This will certainly be done in coordination with the Urban Forest Management Plan for the area south of Duntas that uh, community services will be undertaking. We have a biodiversity strategy, which is really looking at our priorities for restoration. Um, with the throughout the town and we're looking at an update of our environmental plan. I've got the health oriented mixed use node 2017 we should be coming to some conclusions on that and then again the downtown cultural hub and the heritage landscapes we should be moving in the next steps of implementation based on the uh, direction from council on November 28th um, and we'll be concluding the cultural heritage landscape uh, in uh, 2017. So I've mentioned most of these and I won't go through them again. Our building services review will be undertaking our single permit. Uh, the parking pay by phone technology you'll see come in in 2017. Under the good governance there's been actually a variety of uh, projects under with the municipal enforcement group that council has looked at. You had improved the municipal enforcement strategy which again I'll deal with a little bit later. Recently you dealt with the rental residential strategy so we'll be implementing a lot of the um, uh, community engagement policies in 2017, but also under the council direction, we'll be looking at a residential bylaw um, in order to uh, uh, give more teeth to the implementation of that strategy. And we'll be doing that work in 2017. Kerr and, oh, I shouldn't miss the transportation network company licensing, otherwise called Uber. We will be looking at a licensing of that program in the early part of uh, 2017. The great separations occur in Borough Oak, finding uh, uh, partnerships. We had had an announcement from the federal government quite some time ago in Borough Oak, sorting through that and seeing how we can incorporate Kerr into that similar type of program would be our objectives for 2017. The Lakeshore Road environmental assessment will be starting and that's in the western part of town. Um, so we'll be looking at that in coordination with a streetscape study through uh, Bront the Bronte BIA area to understand how you can join the, the buildings themselves and the treatment of the whole public uh, realm through the, particularly through the business area. The bridge reconstruction will happen in 2017. Uh, the downtown transportation streetscape, you will see much more on that in 2017. You'll have the selection of the furniture come forward in the e earlier part of that and the engineering design through the later part of 2017. The pedestrian safety study will be coming forward and that was a follow up on the traffic calming program that you had seen much earlier in the year. And in 2017 with the completion of the stormwater master plan we'll be moving in to look at a stormwater utility model. Many municipalities have implemented a rate charge for stormwater. We'll be looking at a similar type of model based on the analysis coming out of the master plan. So moving on to our operating budget, you can see on this slide that the, the bulk of our programs are, um, uh, the gross budget is 10% is of the town as a whole. It drops to 3.3 because of the revenue component at the net side. In terms of the operating budget by cost type, 
We are predominantly um, uh, personnel. Uh, we also have internal charges or transfers because we have many partners in the programs in which we deliver. So the gross and net operating budget by program, you can see, for example, I use building services at the gross level, they, they sit at 30.9% 30 of the overall budget. They drop to 5.2%. The 5.2% is reflective of um, a small portion of the Committee of Adjustment. Um, that relies on the tax funding. You can also see the change in um, uh, environmental policy, for example, takes on a bigger share only because uh, it's now a much smaller pie and they're 100% through the tax levy. So this is the overall tax levy increase between 2016 to 2017, or 20, yeah, 2017. Uh, infrastructure planning has uh, the largest increase, although they're all relatively small. Planning has decreased, and I will note that one. It has decreased solely because uh, it had, in our recent review, increased its cost recovery percentage. Uh, and then the shortfall in revenue would actually be made up by a uh, withdrawal from the reserve. So it's a little misleading to see it uh, as that, but um, that's the explanation in terms of its cost recovery has been increased. So I think of it, as I've noted already, uh, the program drivers in this commission are really the revenue, the rates that we set, and the infrastructure costs. On the revenue side is the ability to predict the revenue going forward in terms of we're highly dependent on the economy. The allocation program that the region puts out um, drastically influences the, the ups and the downs in the revenue program over time. In terms of the rates, they're influenced by how we can calculate those rates. So building services, I gave the example before, is much an easier calculation uh, than, for example, the planning services. So we're very much driven by the economy. One application doesn't come in and it significantly impacts the, uh, the revenue amounts. Infrastructure costs is certainly another driver. Uh, I think the construction um, uh, index runs at about 3%, so it's higher um, than the consumer price index. Uh, and as more of the infrastructure funding becomes available through the federal government, certainly there's a lot of uh, pressure on uh, construction projects, which will over time increase the cost of delivering those programs. Looking out in it forward, our challenges are going to be in our service delivery, making sure that we can retain our online services, our customer focus, making it easier for people to come and get the services that they require for the various permits. The complexity of the review, uh, this is there, uh, in recent years, you certainly, there are a lot more elements that we need to take into consideration. It's either elements that we've identified through our studies or it's elements that have been identified through legislation. And I'll just skip to the changing legislation has had a significant impact on our delivery of programs and will continue to be a major challenge. Uh, the building code is being reviewed on a much more frequent basis. We have new building code requirements coming out in uh, January of 2017. Uh, and that certainly creates some uh, concerns or challenges in working through those legislation. The extent of development activity impacts us. Infrastructure costing, I think I've covered all of those already. Looking out in the very long term, uh, we will be impacted by climate change in terms of our, our, our infrastructure requirements. Our stormwater management plan will certainly help us give a little bit more resilience to that, but it is going to be an impact. Intensification, uh, the uh, build out of North Oakville reaches about 75% uh, probably in 2017, which means that we'll be moving into the next phase of North Oakville, which is generally the area that's uh, 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 to the north uh, along the 407. Uh, so that means there's a higher reliance on the intensification in order to achieve our uh, requirements within our own official plan and the provincial requirements. Infrastructure funding is going to continue to be a challenge. Um, and on a more positive side, we are putting in place some data analytics, so we'll be much better able to understand what are the changes, and that will give us the information and evidence to be able to respond to how we need to change to um, deal with some of these challenges in the future. 
So there were, and I've got three council reports that were referred to budget committee. Uh, there is a fourth one, which I'll get to in just a minute. The first one was the municipal enforcement strategy. So this was the strategy. Uh, it is set out. Uh, you'll see item six is the agenda for today. And in that, it outlines what are the costs to implement that program. So you'll see in 2017, it would pull in the on-call after-hours service, building up with additional staffing in 2018 to 2019, where it would be the 24-7. So that uh, strategy is reflected in the budget, so you'll see all of it already incorporated in there. Um, but the details of that program is set out in item number six in the um, agenda for today. Number seven is the, uh, the item number seven is the traffic calming program and speed limit review. The two that are not bolded, uh, the all day speed reduction zones and the annual operating costs for the 12 uh, 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 picture, uh, which it tracks your speed. Uh, are, are included in the budget, so they're there. The ones that are bolded, which is the flashing four kilometer per hour zone signs, which we had recommended through that study, are not included in your budget. So if you wanted to proceed with that program, uh, we would be bringing forward uh, recommendations for the budget deliberations uh, later on. But they're both capital as well as operating. I would note on this, though, that the province has recently announced the radar um, of possibilities within the uh, community zones as well as in school zones. So the details of that program are not out. Uh, when we see some of those details, it will overlap with this program. So staff's intent was to, or recommendation to you, would be to approve the capital budget and the operating costs at this point in time. But um, we will not implement the program until we actually see what are the details of the provincial program because there's some areas where we may be recommending the flashing 40 kilometers at this point in time that would be better served with the radar. Um, so there is some flexibility in that. Uh, the cost of the radar program will also be significantly higher, we assume, when we look at the type of equipment than the capital costs here. So we will be reporting back to Council on the implication of that program in 2017 when the details are out. The last item that's on there is item number eight, and that's in your agenda for today as well. There was a request at council for us to review the utility permits for particularly union gas. So we did undertake that review. You'll see the details in the report. Uh, we looked at our legal ability in order to uh, apply a fee to any underground work that happens on our road corridor by union gas. Uh, we are eligible to charge for that, and when you look at council's rates and fees policy, uh, it fits with the rates and fees policies for us to apply that charge. So the charges that the rates and fees do reflect a charge to Union Gas, and they are all incorporated within the budget. The last one uh, in terms of the council reports that is going to deal with was the Heritage Grant Program. Uh, the report that's in here, this program is not included in the budget, so if you wanted to include it, you'd have to deal with it specifically in the budget uh, deliberations. The staff recommendation is $100,000. That's about a $20,000 increase from the existing program. The pilot has been very successful, uh, and when it was received at the Heritage Oakville Committee, they were very positive of the program and actually suggested that there should be an increase in the amount of funding. So staff had recommended a 20,000 increase, so for 100,000 funding to the program. There was, I think, Councillor Hutchins had a question at the last budget meeting about whether or not that should be increased any further. So the chart below is actually the chart that's in the staff report. It shows the uh, available funds, which is the 80,000 currently for the last three years of the pilot program. The middle bar is the amount of uh, requests that were made I um, mean, you can see they were quite high in 2014, dropping down in 2016. And then the taller bar is the total value of the work itself. I think uh, the drop in the request or the value of the request, I think is not reflective of a, uh, a less um, uh, uh, hopefulness of the program. It's really, I think, people began to understand what they were eligible for 
in the program and brought their requests in at the rate in which they could be funded. And that is set out in the report itself. So I think what this is showing though, that there is quite a um, demand out there for this type of program, which in 2016 still exceeded the $100,000 that we're recommending at this point in time. So for the capital budget overview, I've listed in 2017 the 10 top uh, road infrastructure projects, starting of course with the Lakeshore Road Bridge that would be constructed in 2017, uh, and listing on down with the road resurfacing program, of course the grade separations, and I won't go through each of those, I think you're all quite familiar with those. I did also do some highlights of some other program areas. Uh, the uh, treatment of our water resources is becoming a, an increasing cost over time. There's not too many projects in 2017, but I did highlight the creek channel erosion projects that would be undertaken. And then a group of studies that will be uh, done with the, um, you can see the storm utility, the stormwater utility study in there, the signed bylaw review as well as the community energy program, which is shown at 181,000, but is actually dependent on a $90,000 grant that would come from, through from SCM. The last um, highlight is the energy management solution. So over a number of years, the town has been putting quite advanced uh, monitoring or, or uh, energy saving equipment into our buildings. Uh, for the last number of years, we've had the opportunity to use a Seneca data program in order to monitor those, um, at the effectiveness of those types of solutions. That database is not available to us any longer. Um, so what we're recommending here is a, a software program so that we can better manage it, but also actually a, a contract staff for a period of time in order to understand what are the things that we need to do in order to take that information in and actually reflect any changes. If we're not monitoring the data, we're not able to respond to how those buildings could better function. So this gives us the ability to use the equipment that we're already investing in more effectively. I did want to highlight the Clean Water and Wastewater Program, which is a federal program. There have been uh, a phase one of the federal uh, grant program. This is one of them. Uh, the town has now just submitted an application for all of these projects. Uh, they total about 3.9 million, I think it is. And out of that, um, we would pay 25% of it. So these programs are not shown in your 2017 budget. They would need to be moved forward. Um, and the expenses, which is about just over 900,000 from the town's expense to implement all of these programs, would be available through the capital reserve. So we'll bring forward a, uh, a recommendation for you to consider as part of the um, budget deliberations. But it's a great opportunity to be able to implement a variety of projects at a much reduced dollar. And with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Councillor Robinson. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Close. Uh, Going back a number of years, three or four years, maybe more, more I'm sure, I've spent time working with Ray Green and Darnell Lambert on a certain parcel of southwest Oakville that's been inadequately funded from a water standpoint due to the age of the infrastructure. And everybody has said from time to time a lot of this needs to be fixed and a lot of it will be fixed. I got two questions. How much has been fixed so far and how much is left to go? I don't expect you know the answer here right now. So I'm not familiar with the water project that you're uh, well, referring to. Well, it was a, a stormwater project. Oh. oh, so as part of the stormwater master plan, yeah. we will be looking at all the needs uh, and requirements throughout the town. But we started looking at this one a number of years ago. We kept saying we got to look at it. Yes, and we are in detail right now. And the advantage of the stormwater master plan is that we're not only understanding what is the current issue, but it's a modeling exercise that we'll actually be able to, we'll be able to anticipate as climate change changes, what are the additional impacts that are going to be on our system. So we're not only solving the past issues, but we can anticipate the, pu the future issues that are coming forward. So as part of the stormwater master plan, we will be bringing forward the priority areas that need to be looked at um, so that we can consider those as part of the budget steps. 
Hey, well, I appreciate all your hard work, but that's not good enough because we've been talking this way for quite some time, and we're still talking that way. I'm just wondering why, so why some, some of it has not already been repaired. So uh, I can't speak to the specific um, I, I know projects, but what the Stormwater Master Plan is doing is trying to understand the priorities throughout the town. So what are the specific issues with those projects relative to other projects throughout the town so that you can establish a priority to move forward? Well, <laughs> we're going around in circles here. This happens every year. See, Mr. Green's, I got him going here now, so we'll... And I was actually going to confirm that myself. I believe you're speaking to Westry? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that is a, an older part of town, uh, through to the members of committee, uh, that has gone through quite a bit of transition with infill development, much larger homes. And about two years ago, I, I believe, we started running into some of the early problems uh, down in that area. Uh, and admittedly, it is a candidate for storm sewers. Uh, with respect to, uh, we did do maintenance work down there last year. Uh, you'll recall um, the outlet from the local drainage actually cuts through the cemetery. Uh, that is between the two legs of West Street. Uh, through our maintenance group, we did clean out that channel as well as put some asphalt bottom to improve the flow. There was also an older storm sewer that is in the uh, east of the east leg of West River Street. I know our maintenance people actually did some work there. So there have been some improvements from maintenance and operation. Uh, it is certainly one of the, the candidates that I would uh, anticipate coming through this review that would actually be a priority uh, item down there. Uh, the southwest uh, from about fourth line out through Brawny, that is an area of town, especially south of QEW, that's quite uh, flat and not a lot of gradient down there with the infill. So these are the areas that we'll be concentrating a lot on and I anticipate that that should be a strong candidate and uh, if the clean water and wastewater program uh, continues with the feds, it may be a way to have it accelerated. But there has been maintenance work done to make sure that we can deal with as much of the day-to-day -day flows as possible, but at times of, of spike in terms of intensification, hard rainfalls, there will still be some flooding out on the, the roadway. I mean, it is served only by ditches and gravity. Thank you very much, Ray. I appreciate those comments at this level. Yeah, thank you. Is that everything? Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Hutchins. <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, on the, uh, uh, your council reports and referrals in number seven, traffic calming program and speed limit reviews. You're talking about flashing 40 kilometer zones for 189,000 and 48,600 operating. You're recommending that that be passed, but you will, if I understand it, keep it in abeyance in case of the uh, radar zoning regulations from the province come through with a, a different program? Yes, that was a staff recommendation. Okay. Um, that's fine. Uh, I also wanted to know a little bit about how the details of that flashing 40 kilometers zone was, was costed out because you're talking about 7,000 per sign for the 27 signs plus 1,800 labor to install them. Um, as you know, I'm in LED lights and I think I can get them a lot cheaper for you than that. So in the report that was in the agenda, there was quite a bit of detail um, that went into the costing of that program. And perhaps if uh, Dan Cody is here, he could deal more uh, specifically with the costing of that. Or you could wait until we report back on the overall program because we won't be implementing this until we actually see what the program is from the province. I'm prepared to, to wait. To I'm just wanting to bring up the fact that I think there's a cheap way of doing it. Okay. Uh, lastly, um, <clears throat> the clean water, wastewater program where you were saying, when would that come forward? 
what dates would that would you approach? Well, the applications have been yeah. submitted now, so they'll be reviewing those applications and making a decision, I understood, in fairly short order. Oh, okay. So it, that's an imminent, in other words? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the, the money, I, I believe, comes from the capital reserve, uh, which means that these are applications that are in. If all of them aren't um, granted, then we wouldn't pull that money out of the reserve. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's everything. Um, Councillor Lischina. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so first of all, I am pleased to hear that there will be a building services review. Um, that has been a source of, I guess, frustration for many residents that I uh, hear from. What, what is the timing so it starts in 2017 and finishes, or how long is that review? Uh, so we expect the review itself to be finished in 2017. We do, though, anticipate there'll be a fair amount of implementation with it, mostly on the technology side, in order to get our software programs up to speed to be able to deal with the online component. So I would see 2017 as the review itself and into 2018 with implementation. The reason we chose 2017 was because the allocation program at the region starts, we expect, sometime in 2018. So it allows us to get that review underway when permits should be a little bit less. Uh, in terms of workload. And uh, my other question is regarding um, Union Gas with the, with the report. So the, the permits for the uh, new construction and maintenance um, started um, January 2016, is that correct? As I understand, yes. So uh, prior to that, we didn't have a permit uh, inspections for new build or anything like that? That's correct. We didn't have that. In our overall review of... Uh, programs and what we can charge for, uh, we'd introduce this charge. Okay. And so in 2016, um, we, uh, we have a permit for the new build and then for maintenance as well. So we actually have inspectors that go out and do inspections after the maintenance um, or just of the new build? No, it's whether or not there's any underground work that's occurring, whether it's a maintenance program or a new build. Uh, we would have inspections that deal with that. Okay, so uh, so just just uh, from my understanding, the they would get a permit in order to dig. Right. So, and if they're not digging, they don't need a permit. That's right. Councillor Amir. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, um, Commissioner, the. On the slide with the key initiatives for 2017, I didn't see the Spears Road Corridor study. Um, is that still to be done next year? Certainly. And uh, I, I would hope that that is a key initiative as well. And, and we've, um, so that doesn't need any funding. We're all good to go with that one? No, it's all funded and it will be going forward in 2017. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and last, can, can you just clarify a little bit more what, uh, quote, sorting through that in terms of the Burl Oak grade separation means? Uh, so we are, um, Mr. Cozy actually has been quite uh, involved with Metrolinks because they need the, um, uh, the RER implemented, which requires some grade separations. And there was the earlier announcement about Burl Oak. So there has been quite a few discussions about what portion of that they will fund. Um, so I expect those conversations are um, uh, coming to a conclusion in early 2017 so that we can report to council on what are the opportunities for both Burl Oak and I think we also need to look at Kerr Street. So we're looking at those two in coordination. So, um, so then we, so as I, as I am to understand it, and I, re, I, I remember these uh, conversations since the fall of 2015 when it was silly season uh, and commitments were made, um, but it's, so it's a year and a half to figure out when Burlington and Metrolinx and the town are going to get together and do these grade separations? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, it was the funding that needs to be sorted out. Um, and in addition, Metrolinx felt that there was an environmental assessment that needed to be done. We had done one earlier, um, but they felt that there was a new one that needed to be done, and they're out there doing that at this point in time. So they're looking at the various options for reconstruction uh, Burl Oak and what are the costs associated with that. So that oh. work's been ongoing. Okay, so then we would expect budget 2017 then to know when we're going to be spending money to do that separation? Is that a fair statement? Uh, that's what we hope with them. Yes, I think that's a fair statement. Okay. 
Thank you. See you, Green. Shot of that. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the actual, notwithstanding, there was a funding announcement, uh, as you said during that time of the year, uh, just ahead of the election. Uh, it was unclear as to who actually the funding was going to. Uh, and initially, we thought that funding was coming directly to the town of Oakville and the city of Burlington. And had that been the case, we would have probably continued on uh, with REA and went into detailed design and moved forward. Uh, and what actually happened is grade separation money, including Burlough, because it was a number of grade separations that were actually announced across the province, that funding went through to the province through to Metrolinx. So our project and uh, the joint project between ourselves and Burlington is really in the hands of Metrolinx. They got an allotment of money they are now determining how that money will be distributed amongst the number of grade separations. They have not determined uh, the final amount that will be put into the Burl Oak grade separation. That's why there may, we don't know what it is that Metrolinx uh, will be seeking from the town in Burlington. And as Ms. Closey uh, said, um, they felt that the uh, EA needed to be upgraded and that's uh, what they're at going now. I spoke as recently as Monday morning in my office with Mr. McQuaig, advising him that both Oakville and Burlington are most anxious to see this go ahead. And we would do anything we could. And I also reminded him, <coughs> Kerr Street is of great importance yes. to the town of Oakville. And uh, I told him, I'm ready to go again anytime with money that we're prepared to go to that project with. So thank he you. knows our priorities. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then uh, Councillor Chisholm. A uh, question came from, from the, your discussion, um, Ray. With respect to um, the Kerr Street separation, grade separation, if we are on, on time with respect to the, the construction development of this uh, project, would we be held up from Metrolinx with respect to the finances, or would we go ahead and debenture and wait for that money to come to, from Metrolinx? How would, the, how would we handle that? Because I just don't want to see this stall for another two or three years when Metrolinx finally says and gives us uh, the, the edict, this is how much money you're going to get. Well, I, uh, to you, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm um, optimistic based on my discussion with the CEO of Metrolinx that I will be hearing from him shortly on it. If you look at our uh, capital forecast, and, and perhaps, uh, Ms. Sully, you could assist me here, but I believe right now we're sitting with the project in the 22-23 time frame. There is a lot of property issues to be dealt with. I mean, this is perhaps the most complicated uh, grade separation we've ever dealt with. And uh, there's uh, uh, the old long manufacturing building. There's uh, mm -hmm. work to be done on their building with respect to loading docks, property to be acquired, especially from the three plazas uh, south of the tracks. Those discussions are, uh, uh, have been ongoing. We've got all that identified. There is a shortfall if, uh, because when we did our uh, development charge bylaw, it was carried forward but the scope of the work has turned out to be far more. So again, that's why it's a bit delayed in our budget because we will need to, uh, if we went at it alone, there's a sizable increase, partially due to, to the development side, but also you get into that old thing called benefit to existing. My goal is to get Metrolinx to pick up all of the benefit to existing and our funding be only in the areas of development charge. Thank you. And my last question uh, with respect to, thanks, Mr. Green, okay. it's, it's back to Jane. Um, you mentioned stormwater charger, charges mm -hmm. right now, so for clarity's sake, we do not charge off the tax levy or uh, a fee for stormwater management or getting rid of stormwater. Right now, we don't have a fee, is that correct? We, we don't have a fee okay. that would charge, like a rate fee that would charge differently for each property right. in terms of their impact on stormwater. No, we don't. So the plan would be as time moves on with all the development of stormwater and with all the climate changes and, and, and lowlands within Oakville. So we're looking at putting a levy or a charge on for stormwater uh, 
management? We're looking at how we could do that, yes. When And when would that, that I'm not going to want to get into the calculation how that fee is going to be established, but when are we looking at that to, to incorporate that? Maybe it's in the report somewhere. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. No, but it it's in um, 2017. It's one of our objectives to start that work. Whether or not we finish in that year, the um, master plan itself, I think, is finished in April of 2017. So we'll start the work on the utility charge immediately after that because you have an understanding of the costs. So maybe I'm going in, into the weeds here, uh, Commissioner, but if we're looking at a charge, that's outside the tax levy. So when the, when the ta I don't know how that would, with that, off the tax bill, there would be a line item saying stormwater wastewater, whatever the case may be, charge, it'll be highlighted in, in our invoices? Uh, yeah, and that's the way, for example, it's done in Mississauga now. You okay. get a charge that you actually see what your particular charge is for your property based on it. It could be based on a variety of things. It could be based on your roof sur surface. Uh, it could be based on your paved area throughout your property. Um, there's a variety of different ways of, of charging the fee, and that's actually the work that we need to do as part of the, the uh, utility model work. Is this a sorry? One other question: Is this a strategy to look at um, increasing our revenue side outside the uh, the tax the tax levy? Is this something that, or is it uh, a standard practice or um, best practices throughout Ontario? Well, it's uh, many municipalities are moving to that, and it is along the lines of those who have the biggest impact pay. So it's a user pay kind of a model. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Lucena. Sorry, just one last question. Um, I'm not sure, maybe, um, Mr. Lalonde, this might be a question for you. Uh, so this is the, the first year that we've had the, the mediator up front, um, the, the legal for parking permit, uh, parking tickets and all that. This is the first year that we've completed with the person uh, being up front with the, the residents coming in directly. Can you make a comment? Has that, uh, has that been a, a positive program or do we, are we expanding? Are we changing anything with that? Um, my preliminary feedback is that it is a positive program. Um, we used to make people walk up to the parking office at the back of the building and stand in a very unsatisfactory spot uh, to have a, uh, an interview. Uh, I think the location at the front of the building is much, much uh, more satisfactory to everybody involved. And uh, I think we are um, having a good impact with the actual process. We've, we've um, changed the way we staff it a little bit, and I would say the early indications are that it's going very well. Um, so it's, it, no, uh, we still have to we still have to determine exactly what the volumes are going to be. Um, we thought we had estimated that I thought we had estimated higher than the volumes were going to be at first, but I believe the estimates were fairly accurate. So we're monitoring that. Any other questions? Okay, I have one question for you. You also provided us with a preliminary map, which course I appreciate. Um, I do have a question about the uh, pedestrian uh, structure locations. So in our forecast we've got a number of locations that are identified but we don't identify the year associated with any particular structure. What's the process for getting to a point where we have a year identified with any particular structure? Oh I think actually Dan might be able to answer this a little bit clearer. I think we do it through our, um, we take a report to you each year which identifies the projects that we're doing. Um, and that, uh, similar to the resurfacing program, we bring forward a report that identifies the, the projects. We do it with the active transportation master, with the active transportation projects as well. I'm looking at Dan. Okay. Yeah, so um, uh, this doesn't get heard on the, the system, but... Um, they are more significant structures. Each one is um, a big dollar, not a small dollar structure. Uh, and so you're probably un only undertaking one or possibly two each year, uh, given the timing of the, the funding. So if maybe I can just answer, our, as Dan said, our because I've got a mic and Dan doesn't. <laughs> yes. Our ATMP, our master plan, will identify when they should be constructed. But we'll look at that through the capital planning, the affordability as well. 
um, as we move forward with that. So there, there, to complement that, there's the annual report that goes forward, even after they've been identified through the master plan and then the capital plan, that will identify which specific projects we can proceed with. So we'd be confirming them in the early part of each year as we confirm which sidewalks were redoing and that yeah, sort of you look long term in the years. master plan in terms of when you see them happening in the cap the 10 year capital plan you'd refine that out a little bit more and then each year each year you do the budget you would refine the capital plan the longer term but also specifically what you do that year okay and then i have uh, one more question which is related to the transportation master plans the number of crossing points uh, there's a 403 crossing point that we have planned way out in the future uh, between the, QE, um, the QEW and the Dundas uh, crossing points that we have now, uh, I'll say midpoint between Upper Middle and Dundas. Uh, we have other crossing points around the, the Midtown area that are being planned sometime way out in the future. Um, when do those show up? I know they're not in the 10-year forecast, uh, but how far out are those? Uh, I think the Midtown projects are about yeah, 10 years away they're quite out there in the process we're, we are looking at what are some funding opportunities to try and see if we can deal with those at an earlier point but at this point they're in the late 20s thank you and if there are no further questions then we have mayor burton thank you mr chair mr chair i'm i'm wondering uh what would staff need to extend site plan control to our established neighborhoods and our so-called neighborhoods in transition? Uh, we'd need, uh, we have all the bylaw requirements there right now, so legislatively, we'd need to make some changes to actually to the bylaw and the official plan to identify those additional areas where you would want site plan applicable. And then in terms of the implementation, we would need to look at what is the staffing requirement that would need to come with that. Um, how could uh, how could we get uh, uh, could we get a report as part of the budget process as to how soon you could do this? Uh, yes, we could. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Can you just uh, clarify the extension of the site plan control process? Which areas are you trying to identify to in incorporate them? The stable established neighborhoods is identified in the official plan. And the, uh, there's this emerging term that I hear alarmingly all the time at the Committee of Adjustment, a neighborhood in transition, which doesn't, I mean, that, I don't think that term has a, a, uh, a planning validity in that I don't think you can find that in our official plan or our zoning, but um, that phrase has been used several times to excuse um, uh, applying our official plan to a neighborhood when it comes to applications to um, essentially ignore section 11.9, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the sub, 11.9.2 is it? Thank you, that was, um, that was the term that I was worried about because I normally call those stable neighborhoods <laughs> and many others might too. <laughs> right, the, the problem, Mr. Chair, is that uh, our good work and intentions in the Livable Oakville official plan um, uh, get undone by some of these these slang expressions that have popped up from time to time, uh, notably at the committee. So Thank you. It, 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 be, it has become clear, I, I believe, that in order to preserve um, uh, both our, um, our, um, our stable, established neighborhoods and to preserve our... Um, large growth trees in those neighborhoods that I, I believe we're going to have to extend site plan control to these to these properties. Otherwise, uh, people can, on a lot with a bungalow with permission for two stories and a bigger footprint, without the need of uh, any approval, they can just pull a building permit and away they go. If I could add or clarify through you, uh, Chair Adams, to Mayor Burton, we are, as part of the site plan enhanced process, um, using the stormwater master plan as our evidence base in which to set our requirements for a site plan review um, in the process of doing that now. 
Uh, we also, on the basis of the urban forest, uh, the urban forest management plan that will come forward in 2017 that's being undertaken, set a basis in which to establish the targets for tree cover specifically by land use. And that would then form the evidence basis for a site plan uh, to have those two elements part of a site plan. But I think what I took your question to be is apply site plan throughout the stable residential communities as site plan now stands with the uh, site plan committee. So it would be the full site plan process. If that's what you're looking for, we can certainly do indicate what, uh, what, it, what our ability to do that. Right, and anywhere a neighborhood, I mean, by mentioning this slang phrase that I hate hearing from the committee, neighborhood in transition, I, I want to signal that staff needs to figure out a way to nip that in the bud, because it's, uh, it's being used to undermine the intent of the official plan, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, and, and I believe that it may be possible to have a site plan control that I'm talking about delegated to the, to the director. Um, I, I, I don't have a position on whether it should come to committee or, or be delegated. I just know that unless we get these properties under site plan control, we, I don't see how we have a way to uh, uh, arrest the, uh, uh, the loss of stable neighborhoods and the loss of tree cover. Very good, Councilor O'Meara. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and sorry, uh, Commissioner. I'm, I'm I'm very cognizant that this is a budget committee meeting, and and but Mayor Burton's comments have got me um, thinking uh, that pretty much everything has budget implications. So, um, are we prepared, and are we uh, looking at where we may or may not allow um, medical marijuana dispensaries in the town in our official plan, uh, or is that something we're we're going to be looking at next year, as this seems to be getting closer and closer to uh, uh, to something we will have to address? Uh, no, we hadn't specifically identified that as a program because I think most of it's covered by fed federal legislation. So we have a limited ability to have an impact on that. We can review it, though, and see if there's any area that we would have control. But I know our previous review was it's entirely a federal piece, and we have a limited opportunity there. So we couldn't control where these places could go? Um my review of the previous legislation was that, no, we didn't. It was established through the federal legislation. Well, there you go. Quick answer. Thank you. Okay. I think we are done. Uh, thank you very much and congratulations for getting through the, uh, the ring of uh, questions. Uh, we're ready to move on to Community Services Commission. Welcome and it's, it's your turn to face the team. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm very pleased to present the Community Services uh, Commission budget for 2017. Our programs uh, under this particular commission are emergency services, recreation and culture, parks and open space, infrastructure maintenance, transit, and we have a, a linked relationship to the library. For our outstanding service to the public, for these are just highlights, by the way, of uh, the team's accomplishments. In September, we uh, introduced the first year of the transit service plan. Our riders are now experiencing increased frequency of transit uh, service. And I'm very pleased to report for the first time in two and a half years, we've had three consecutive months of uh, transit ridership growth. I, I should note that we did ask uh, other transit properties uh, what their experience has been in the last while, and the only other one to report any growth is York Region. In February, we introduced our mobile app, uh, which is ITS, so riders can now uh, access real-time transit information on any mobile device um, which they want to use. And as of Monday of this week, uh, we had over 9,000 downloads. Uh, emergency Services uh, has developed a new fire master plan for the next 15 years with a major focus on fire prevention. We also installed uh, mobile data uh, terminals on all of our suppression vehicles, so our fire crews now have access to real-time information while they're attending a call. Our Roads and Works team uh, led a very successful coordination support for the K Canadian Open this year. And the library uh, is moving in a very innovative way. They are in the process of developing their new 
uh, strategic plan with three major focuses, uh, digital transformation, a greater community partnership enhancement, and also a new philanthropy strategy. They are in the process right now of planning the rollout for self-checkout at all of their branches through RFID technology, which Councillor Lalonde mentioned earlier. And they're also um, doing two innovation projects this year. They're in the process of designing the first digital hub or creation space at Iroquois Ridge Library, which is very exciting. It will open next year uh, in time for Canada Day. And they also uh, have introduced an incubator library model at QEPCC. And the intent behind that was to start to look at how to provide libraries, uh, library services in non-traditional space and test out new concepts before they actually roll them out to uh, more formal library locations. Our Roads and Works team uh, also completed the first phase of LED streetlight implementation and are eagerly starting to plan for phase two. And all departments worked on the development of the corporate digital strategy, which Commissioner Lalonde mentioned earlier. Uh, we also worked uh, collaboratively with Community Development Commission on the update of the private tree bylaw. Our forestry team undertook an extensive review of the EAB program, and they looked at it from three perspectives. They wanted to see if they could improve efficiency throughout all of their processes. They wanted to see if there were any part of the program that they could accelerate. And they also wanted to ensure that they stayed within the existing uh, capital budget forecast. As a result of this review, they were able to accelerate the program in three particular areas. The first one was road and active uh, parks tree removal. Uh, they will actually be finishing almost all of it in 2016, two years ahead. They also will be doing tree replacement uh, on roads and active parks, and they will have that completed by 2019, two years ahead. And they will also be doing hazard abatement removal, and that will be two years ahead in 2019. We are also working, they were also working on the iTree project. So what they did was they were measuring the tree canopy of 2015 against the tree canopy of 2005. And in spite of the fact that we had uh, devastation experienced through EAB and also an excruciating ice storm which damaged 11,200 trees, our tree canopy actually increased by 1.3%. Our uh, parks and open space team is also working on the harbors master plan. We will have completed most of the, the consultation by the end of this year and we'll be tabling uh, the plan for council's consideration in early next year. We actually um, introduced a second uh, pollinator garden. Our first one was in Glen Abbey. Our, our second one is in Shell Park, and Shell Park uh, recently was the recipient of second place winner of the All-America Selections Competition. And we also introduced our first North Oakville Neighborhood Park at Isaac Park. Enhancing our cultural and social environments, our recreation and culture uh, team is working on the implementation of their strategic plan. Uh, the strategic plan has a major focus on community development and building capacity, and we are already in process of developing community plans by neighborhood. They also were working on uh, the development of an age-friendly strategy in partnership with community members. Uh, this is a very important initiative. It is based on the World Health Organization model, and it looks at structures and services through the lens of an aging population. We, uh, we did not forget the youth of the community. We opened a new Notting, Notting Hill Gate Youth Center, uh, known by the participants as NYC, and it is immensely popular. We also hosted a very successful National Adult Figure Skating Championship at 16 Mile, and the, cultural plan te the, cult the culture team worked on uh, the, an update of the culture plan and the culture plan has uh, four major focuses. One is a public arts strategy, uh, building uh, new cultural programming, working more closely in terms of partnerships, um, both with the public and private sector. In terms of key program outcomes, uh, we just selected uh, basically one or two by our uh, departments. The first one is for roads and works. And as you can see, the number of deficiencies per lane kilometer is actually decreasing, so we see that is very positive. Uh, recreation uh, program registrations, as you can see, are 
uh, definitely on the move upward, and a lot of that can be attributed, attributed to the incredible hard work of our summer camps teams who have just done an outstanding job. We also see a continued uptake, although it is a little bit slower with the online registration uptake. It will be interesting to see whether this does a jump when we actually move to a new system. Uh, one of the goals in terms of the new system is to ensure that we have a much more user-friendly interface for the public. Um, class is many things, but easy to use would not be a description for it from a public standpoint. And uh, for uh, firefighters, to a scene in four minutes uh, is sitting at 74.6. This is a watching uh, per, uh, performance measure right now. And the reason for it is uh, twofold. It's uh, increasing traffic congestion. And also we've had a large number of road construction projects which have required, in some cases, detours. So we will be watching this on an ongoing basis. Number of act active library card holders per capita. This is based on uh, a card being used actively over the last two years. Um, in 2012, they did a purge, so the numbers were um, somewhat skewed. So we only focused from 2013 to 2016, and as you can see, uh, the number of card users is actually going up. Parks and Open Space looked at the number of trees and shrubs planted, um, particularly from a, a tree canopy standpoint. You will note that in 2016 we had a massive jump, and that, the reason for that is we started the Woodland Regeneration Program, and that's really made a huge difference in um, our ability to uh, move in this area. Transit ridership uh, is up, and uh, we are projecting 2.853 for 2016. We do have a caution on this one because the growth has just started since the, slightly before the introduction of the new transit system, uh, service plan. So we are proceeding cautiously, but we remain very hopeful that the growth will continue. These are just some of the highlights for our 2016, or, sorry, 2017 initiatives. In terms of outstanding service to the public, FIRE will be implementing their FIRE master plan, and they will be doing a review of uh, our emergency plan. They will be opening fire station number three in Trafalgar Park. And what's not listed here, but I know is of particular interest to councillors, is we will be launching the EpiPen program starting the first week of January in 2017. So they, we will be having EpiPens on all of our suppression vehicles going forward. Transit is going to be working in a joint procurement with the city of Hamilton to uh, procure demand response scheduling software for riders. What this means is that uh, riders who want to access specialized transit, um, either because of uh, mobility or cognitive issues, or because they want to access our new home to hub service, will be able to do that online and through IVR. So um, we're quite excited about that new initiative. We, uh, uh, sorry, um, I've mixed this up. The demand response scheduling software is not with the city of Hamilton. The onboard video surveillance cameras is with the city of Hamilton. And the intent behind that is to ensure the greater public safety for both our passengers and uh, our staff. In terms of innovation, the library will be opening their new digital hub or creative zone as they've officially branded it at uh, Iroquois Ridge Library. We will certainly be monitoring closely uh, what the success and uptake on that is because there is the intent to uh, broaden that initiative to all branches over the course of time. We will be launching a new beta testing site, and that was uh, referenced in the digital strategy. And the intent behind that is to engage citizens more actively at the, the um, earlier stages of development of online services. This has been piloted very successfully with the City of New York and with the UK government, and they find that through uh, more active citizen engagement that by the time they actually do a formal launch of an online service, they already know that the, there's going to be huge uptake because there's been so much public input and that the design is clean and very intuitive to use. Um, in April of this year, the province introduced uh, new legislation called Supporting Our First Responders Act. And we are now required as an employer of first responders to actually have a prevention plan in place. And the purpose behind this is to uh, accelerate and, and uh, streamline access to WSIB claims and, and get quicker support and treatment where required. Uh, 
Roads and Works is going to be working on phase two of the LED street light program. They will be converting all of the decorative features um, across town and uh, we have a report requesting uh, $6.6 .6 million in pre-approval. The reason for this is because we have a number of different types of decorative features across the town, some of which are no longer um, available and we will need to do extensive uh, consultation with neighborhoods to see how, uh, what sort of um, fixtures they will be interested in going forward. And of course, we will be working on the recreation software replacement for class. Under enhancing our natural environment, uh, we will be working with community development for the urban forest strategic management plan update. Um, forestry will continue to work on their accelerated EAB program and the two areas of focus um, for 2017 is going to be tree replacement and ongoing work with woodland uh, hazard abatement. We will be finalizing the Harbors Master Plan and bringing that forth for Council's consideration. We will be doing a trail accessibility audit which uh, is very complementary to the Age Friendly Initiative. Uh, to ensure that um, all residents, regardless of mobility issues, are able to enjoy our trail system. And we will be implementing the 16 Mile Creek West Shore Landscape Master Plan Phase 3. Um, that particular area goes from the West Pier over to Waterworks Park, and uh, we will be starting the shoreline engineering next year. We will be doing targeted dredging in, in specific problematic areas in 16 Mile Creek. And as part of our cultural and social environments, we have a number of Canada 150 initiatives to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday. Uh, we will have three exhibits at the Oakville Museum uh, will, that will be on display for the benefit of the public. Um, OCPA will be presenting Tales of the Town, which is based on local stories that were collected last summer from local residents. We will be um, doing a Canada-themed children's festival, which we're very excited about. And we will be working in close collaboration with the Bronte BIA to have one of the best Canada Day celebrations ever. We are actually in the process right now of doing a five-year review of the 2012 Parks, Recreation, and Library Master Plan. So we will be looking at updating our demographic information, testing our assumptions to assure that we have the right recommendations going forward. We will also be undertaking an older adult, uh, a review of our older adult services, which is also complementary to the age-friendly initiative as well. And we will be doing design and validation of future uh, recreation amenities at Southeast Oakville Community Center. And the last one that we're going to be undertaking was in support of the Downtown Cultural Hub. Uh, we need to do a theater feasibility study from the standpoint of um, end of life, how long will the theater continue to function in the manner that it does uh, before we will be in a situation where we will either have to do a massive renovation or tear down and build. We want to make sure that council has very practical options going forward and that this has been a very thoughtful process. For our gross operating and net operating budgets, as you can see, community services under their gross operating budget, we constitute 55% of the uh, gross operating budget and 67.3% of the net operating budget. The three main areas of uh, expense are in the areas of wages and benefits, uh, purchase services, and internal expenses and transfers. By our gross operating budget, the three largest, uh, for both budgets actually, the three largest budgets are uh, emergency services, infrastructure maintenance, and Oakville Transit. Our over overall tax levy increase is 3.5 million, and again, it's in the areas of emergency services, uh, infrastructure maintenance, and transit. Specifically for fire, uh, the areas, uh, two areas that have driven uh, their budget have been wages and benefits and movement through pay grades. Uh, the other area is uh, the renewal of the Appleby Dispatch uh, Agreement. It came in at 3.1%. 2% was inflationary and the 1.1% is tied to increased number of calls for Oakville. Under the transit area, the three areas are annualization of the, five, the year one of the uh, transit service plan, 
uh, wages and benefits, and increased demand for uh, accessible services. And this is an area that we're going to be watching very closely because the legislation changes in January for AODA, and now uh, people with, uh, who have cognitive issues will also be eligible to use uh, specialized transit. Under uh, infrastructure maintenance, the three big areas are wages and benefits, uh, purchase services such as um, winter control, um, street lights, um, road repair, and uh, the other one is actual supplies, so de-icing, um, hydro, those kinds of things. Our five major challenge areas are, are as follows. So the first one is the impact of legislation changes. Um, AODA, which I've just mentioned, is going to have a definite impact on transit uh, starting January 1st because of the change to eligibility for specialized transit. Uh, the other area is uh, there are contemplated changes to the provincial road maintenance standards, uh, particularly in the area of winter control for uh, sidewalks, pathways, and bike lanes. So this could have a significant cost implication. External drivers are, uh, we're waiting to see what happens with the negotiations of the Presto Agreement and what the pricing ends up being. Um, right now, uh, we pay 2% two, two and the changes could be quite significant. So this is something that our entire senior team is monitoring very closely. Uh, we will also be looking at the results of the interest arbitration for the fire collective agreement uh, that will be coming out sometime next year. And also inflationary uh, pieces in terms of potential fuel, hydro, uh, and uh, we're finding that in some areas that uh, pricing for materials is going up. <coughs> Under new technology, the two big areas that will have the most impact on us is RFID technology for the library. Uh, it, it's quite revolutionary in terms of how it will impact their uh, operating team. Uh, right now they're in the process of redoing all their job descriptions, redoing their scheduling, and there's actually some renovations that have to be done. Um, at the individual branches to accommodate the equipment. So it has more far-reaching implications uh, than was originally contemplated. And the other area, of course, is uh, the class replacement for recreation and culture. Service delivery area uh, challenges uh, are really in two areas. The first one is for transit, and it's their ability to provide coverage in low-density, low ridership areas. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at doing is how to expand home to hub uh, services, which is a much cheaper way of providing service without having large buses um, operating through a particular neighborhood. The other um, area is managing expanded needs for services because of growth while staying uh, within the uh, council mandated uh, budget increase. And that uh, is going to prove to be very challenging over the next two or three years. And the last one is the people plan, and that's really tied to uh, three major areas for community services. Uh, we are continuing to experience skill shortages in areas like uh, finding uh, qualified arborists because the, after the ice storm, it has created a huge shortage, and there's also large initiatives going on as EAB spreads across the GTA. So arborists are in very, very high demand. Uh, we are also looking at how to develop uh, future leaders right from the point of entry into our organization. And we're also looking at the ongoing management of retirements over the next five years. In terms of council reports and referrals, there were four reports that were referred uh, to this particular committee for consideration. The first one was the RBC Can Canadian Open. Uh, the request there specifically is to um, be authorized to use money from the tax stabilization uh, reserve uh, in the amount of $90,000 so that uh, we can continue to provide support to the Canadian Open. This is very much in keeping with how we have done things in previous years. We are also asking for a pre-approval through the street lighting LED conversion for $6.6 .6 million. Uh, in order to meet council schedule, we need to also be able to accommodate fairly significant public consultation because we are now talking about decorative fixtures, which everyone 
who is impacted will certainly have an opinion and we need to ensure that they have an opportunity to share that with us. Under the cultural uh, plan implementation, there are three asks. The first one is uh, for $25,000 to be added to the cultural grants program. Uh, in the past, uh, we have provided in the neighborhood of 110,000. There is 113,000, which is uh, reflecting the rate of inflation, but we would like to um, ask Council's consideration of the 25,000. Uh, we are currently funding 29 organizations and more and more are coming forward um, as communities mature and develop. So that's an area that we would like to look at. The second one is a request for $27,000, which is part-time staff to provide new cultural programming. And the last one is $500 for logistics so that we can actually facilitate uh, meetings between cultural groups and businesses. The intent behind that is that we want to start to link business uh, people as mentors with cultural groups to help advise them on, on how to improve financial sustainability, how to improve their fundraising um, capacity, uh, those kinds of things. Under the private tree bylaw, the request there is for 1.5 um, FTE, which is inspectors. And the purpose behind that is that we would actually um, recover the cost through the permit revenue. And the last three are requests that came from the chair on uh, Tuesday, and that's the expansion of leaf collections into uh, new areas, alternative operating models for community centers, and strategic planning process for the library. Under the capital budget overview, for 2017 to 2026, uh, community services uh, has projected spending $440 million, the highlights of which are uh, vehicle replacement and uh, expansion vehicles for transit, roads, and parks, and fire, uh, continued work on the EAB program, uh, the phase two of the North Ops uh, Depot, and uh, the North Park Sports Park Phase 2 and Fire Station Number 4 expansion. For 2017 specifically, we are requesting $61.4 million. And the highlights for those are Trafalgar Park revitalization at $13 million, LED street lighting Phase 2 at 6.6, .6, expansion buses for transit at 4.8, the EA Breed program at 3.7, the seawall rehabilitation around the Oakville uh, Powerboat Club at 2.6, uh, major vehicle refurbishment for transit at 2.4, uh, ongoing uh, equipment replacement for roads and works and parks at 2.1, and the 16 Mile Creek West Shore landscape rehabilitation at 1.4, and waterfront trail improvement tannery waterworks at 1.2. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Councillor Robinson, you had some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Bell, you probably have an idea what I might be going to ask you. But would you mind repeating to me what your comments were at the beginning of your presentation respecting library service for Bronte? Okay, so in, uh, are you asking specifically, Councillor, where the Bronte Library is in the capital? I'm just asking what your comments were. So my comments were that uh, the library is undertaking um, two actually major studies. The first one is the development of their new strategic plan, which looks at three areas. One is the development of digital transformation. Two is in the area of community partnerships. And three, it's in the area of uh, a new philanthropy strategy. Uh, the consultants have recommended to the library that they may want to broaden their fundraising capability and also look at um, new sources of funding uh, from non-traditional sources, so that, which would complement the funding that they receive from the town. They are also part of the five-year review of the um, Parks, Recreation and Library Master Plan. What we are doing in that particular instance is we are looking at the plan that was developed in 2012 
and we are um, actually updating all of the demographic information, including the new census information that will be coming out in February. We will be looking at um, how growth has actually unfolded over the last five years, what work has already been completed, and where do we need to go. And we are also reviewing the uh, original recommendations and revalidating that they are still appropriate going forward. But, but how, thank you for that. But how do I explain that this is going to enhance the long-promised library service for Bronte? How, how, how do I do that? Well, I think that what's going to be really important to explain is that the library is undergoing a really exciting period of transformation. Um, they are looking at becoming a much more um, innovative organization on a variety of fronts, and that any libraries that uh, get built or introduced to a, a new area of Oakville are going to be far more in, in exciting and enriched by this change in direction. So it's worth, in short, it's worth the wait. Uh, thank you for that. I won't take up any more of your time today about that, but I would like to have a little chat with you offline. Is that okay? That would be that would be lovely. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, Councillor Hutchins. Thank you. Um, this RFID is very interesting. Uh, I, f I find it, and uh, obviously, it's, it's one of the ways to go. Will that? Be a, there will be a saving of personnel eventually down the road, uh, you think, uh, when, with all these uh, different uh, technologies? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, absolutely. So uh, what the library has undertaken so far is they have actually done a very formal uh, review uh, through a lean process. And so what they have done is they have systematically um, documented all of their processes, timed the length of time that each component takes, and they've also itemized which, uh, how many resources are required for each point in time. And what they have done through that process is they've actually looked at how to streamline their processes and modernize them before they've even gone in to do the actual installation of the RFID, RFID technology. What they are in the process of doing are documenting what the hours of time are that they will be able to save over an accumulative basis and assign a cost to it. In other jurisdictions, what uh, libraries will often do when they in install RFID technology is, particularly if there have been cutbacks, they will use the, ex the um, freed up uh, staff hours to actually expand uh, operating hours or be able to redeploy them in a different way within the organization as a cost containment. So um, it's been very successful in other jurisdictions and we anticipate it's going to be great here as well. Well, that's excellent. Uh, I was anticipating your answer along those sort of lines. Um, I just have one other question which I'm confused about on the buses. Um, I understand transit bus replacement and refurbishments is 5.6 million. I had understood that the province uh, gasoline tax helps pay for those buses. Is, am I wrong? No, we do use um, gas tax to supplement our uh, capital program and we do use a small amount of provincial gas tax to uh, smooth out the operating budget as well. Councillor Robinson, did you have a follow-up question? No, I wanted to give you a motion. Very good. I'll come back to you then. Councillor Lischina. Thank you for that report, Commissioner. Uh, perhaps this might be a question for uh, Mr. Cole. Um, in the same line of questioning about the buses, um, do we, I mean, you always hear what the troubles of Toronto with respect to delays on getting their <coughs> replacement done. Do we do anything with any other municipality with respect to ordering the number of buses? Do you get same thing with the economy of scale uh, for better pricing of the buses? Do you want me to take that first? For you, Mr. Chair. Um, Oakville Transit currently participates in the Metrolinx uh, joint. Uh, I got nothing here. Oakville Transit, there we go. Oakville Transit currently participates in the Metrolinx joint procurement process. Uh, there's about 13 municipalities that come together and purchase all of their buses, so the economies of scale is supposed to uh, materialize Sorry, through that Councilor process. Councillor Robinson, could you turn off your mic? I think that might be causing trouble. 
I'm sorry. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, I've um, got a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, I really wanted to thank our staff in the generation of the capital budget this year, uh, where in the parks uh, area there were a number of sections where staff pre-identified the areas mm -hmm. or the projects that they think uh, what would otherwise be a general pool of funding which projects they were going to be used for, for example, in the bridges and stairs area uh, as one. And there were a couple of other ones that I wanted to uh, note that were equally well done. Uh, there were a couple of ones that I, I did have some questions for you uh, because they didn't identify them, and that included the, the pathway rehab and some of the sports field uh, categories where there weren't specific uh, parks that were identified, though I, I do note that in the uh, the operating budget section on page 190 where you're noting your key initiatives you do note uh, rehabil rehabilitation of soccer fields at Oakville Park uh, construction of new track walking paths field house to accommodate the new school there um, so that might be one of them but there may be others uh, that are using that same pool of funding is that correct yes or, or is there a broader list that staff could provide no uh, are you asking if you would like a list uh, I like would a broader like a list, list. Uh, like I've asked in a couple of other years, and, and like I said, staff have al already uh, right. identified in a number of the other categories the particular parks, the particular facilities that are going to go through a, a rehabilitation. We'd uh, be so happy to provide that for that you. That would be great. Thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate that. Um, and that, I think, was the only thing I had for you guys. Th um, any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Uh, Mayor Burton. Okay, uh, you uh, wish to move a motion to receive the uh, first item. Councillor Robinson, you wanted to move a motion. I'm not sure what the motion was. That's what the motion was. Okay, then we're then <laughs> Councillor Robinson is going to move that we receive uh, item one. There are a number of items here on the agenda that I. Uh, I believe we really should be deferring to the December 6th meeting and um, and uh, the mayor would like to speak to some of those he says so uh, those that I think uh, really we are simply receiving are items uh, one six uh, seven eight the other ones I think we really are deferring though on the traffic calming program speed limit review I think we may be having some additional discussion around uh, the issue of the funding needs for uh, those various programs. Mayor Burton? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, Councillor Robinson has moved a receipt of item number one. Uh, are there any further questions on that? No? Then all those in favour? That's carried. Item number two is the 2017 RBC Canadian Open. Uh, I recommend that we defer that to the December 6th meeting. Councillor Robinson, are you moving that? Well, are you sure? Very good. Mayor Burton? Given that this item has no tax impact that I can see and the need to begin the planning <laughs> is uh, upon us, I believe that um, nothing is gained by deferring the RBC Canadian Open item and I would, I would move it as presented. Um, there's, there's no benefit to doing it earlier in as much as it doesn't get the council any faster. So, um, we have a motion to defer. All those in favor of that? All those opposed? Okay. Count, uh, Mayor Burton is moving the recommendation as it is. All those in favor? That's passed. Okay. Uh, item number three is visit Oakville Tourism Service Delivery. Uh, that's one that I recommended that we defer. Mayor Burton? I agree with deferring this, and I hope that... I was, de I was um, hoping in the report to read um, measurable key performance indicators that we could track whether this money was being uh, usefully spent or not. And uh, I wonder if, while we defer it, additional information could come forward to, uh, to give me uh, more confidence in supporting it. So I would, I would move deferral with a request for that additional information on KPIs. Okay. Councillor Hutchins, yep. Go ahead. Yes, I was, 
I'd also like to find that information, but I'm also concerned about the 2019 Lakeshore Road uh, construction and whether this funding is going to increase and be part of the measures to, to ameliorate uh, the downtown's need to get people down there. I'm not sure if our staff have any comments on that particular question at this time. I see an answer coming down the aisle. I'll come back to you in a second, Mayor Burton. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the mitigation measures for the downtown reconstruction will be coming forward as part of the design phase for the Lakeshore Road reconstruction project. Certainly, um, any of the tourism um, initiatives and increased funding to tourism can only help um, uh, bring more people downtown, um, but they are two separate issues. Okay. Mayor Burton. So in my mind, um, uh, the, the 2017 allocation for tourism and the 2019 reconstruction are um, they're two separate items. And all I'm asking for is uh, more information about what key performance indicators that are measurable so that we can, uh, to assist us in wanting to do this. Um, it's, it's great to increase tourism to the benefit of the of the Oakville businesses, but only if it actually does that. And that's why I wanted to see evidence that it would. It's so I have a motion to defer item number three to the meeting of December 6th and that staff provide additional information regarding key performance indicators. That's exactly what I'm moving. Okay. Then all those, if, are there any other speakers? All those in favor? That's carried. Item number four is a street lighting LED conversion program update. Uh, again, uh, this is one that I suggested should be uh, deferred, uh, but I recognize that it's unlikely to change. But, uh, Mayor Burton? I believe that uh, um, we're, we're fully committed to this program, oh, yeah. and, and therefore uh, I, I move the, the recommendation as presented. Okay. Any uh, speakers on that? Then I'll take the motion um, to approve the staff recommendations, items one, two, and three as part of part four. All those in favor? That's carried. Item number five is the Heritage Grant Program. Uh, I recommend that this one be deferred for some further consideration. Mayor Burton? So moved. All those in favor? That's carried as a deferral to December 6th. Item number uh, six is the Municipal Enforcement Strategy, a recommendation to receive. Mayor Burton? I uh, move receipt. All those in favor? That's carried. Item number seven is the Traffic Calming Program and Speed Limit Reviews item. Uh, there's a recommendation to receive this item. Uh, and it, Councillor Hutchins? It has been moved for receipt. All those in favor? That's carried. Item number eight is the utility permit requirements for working with municipal road allowance. It's a motion to receive would be appreciated. Councillor Hutchins, all those in favor? That's carried. Item number nine is the cultural plan implementation request. I suggest this one be deferred to December 6th. Mayor Burton? So moved. Has moved that. All those in favor? That is carried. Item number 10 is the updated private tree protection bylaw. Again, I recommend that it be deferred. Mayor Burton? Um, I actually uh, prefer to move uh, this as presented. Uh, I believe that council is unanimously committed to um, responding positively to the, the widespread demands of the public for a uh, stronger and more effective private tree protection bylaw. And, and I support council uh, in that goal, and, and thus I, I move it now. Uh, Councillor Robinson? I just have a question, Mr. Chair. Why, why was it being recommended that it be deferred? I, I only recommended those items. I recommended all those items that um, had an impact directly on the budget so that we can consider them in their, the budget in its entirety instead of piecemeal. Uh, but I recognize the positions that are being put but forward. But it's okay if I support the mayor? Absolutely. <laughs> all those in favor of the motion, all those, that is carried. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, sorry. C Councillor, um, is it confined to table over here or can we ask a question? 
You are welcome to ask a question. Yes, just on the uh, private tree bylaw, uh, just a, a quick question um, to staff. With respect to the, the, and it is budget, I'm talking about the dollar amount. Uh, the first tree is $50, then we jump right to 325 for the second tree. I, I'm, I just want to understand what the rationale behind that, because I'm getting, is, I know we're going to get some, some issue with that, and all of a sudden, with, on the common sense side, and so one tree is 50, and one's 325. I just need to have a little bit of clarification on that. Mr. Chairman, when we looked at the fees for the, um, for the private tree bylaw, we looked at a, a graduated fee based on the diameter of, of the trees right up from <clears throat> 15 centimeters right up to well over 100. The impl impl implications of administering a fee for every size class was going to be very, very complex, especially for the public. So we decided that at a smaller level tree, a 15 centimeter to 24 centimeter, there wasn't a lot of uh, administrative work in terms of looking at that permit and administering that permit, so we said that fee would be $50. Once you get above 24 centimeters into the 40 centimeter and 50 centimeter range, that's when you're actually going out on site, <clears throat> you're doing a review, and you're actually um, uh, doing a couple of site visits. The amount of time it takes to do a 40 to 50 versus a 60 to 80 or 90 centimeter is not a lot in terms of the staff time going out there. So we decided just to make it um, easier for the public to uh, understand and also for, for administration purposes, just to flatline the cost at 325 once you get above that 24 or 25 centimeter range. We felt that was much easier to administer and much, again, easier for the public to, uh, to understand rather than have about six or seven different uh, rates and fees, as is the case in some municipalities. They might have four or five or six different fees based on the size of the tree. The th I understand that, Mr. Mark. Thank you very much for the for the explanation. What my suggestion would be is, looking at this fee, that we're very clear on what the basis of that fee of 325, what what the um, cost, the actual cost, and what the performance of staff, what they need to do. So there's an equation there. I know it's in the report and somewhere, but I think that question has to be very clearly articulated, or excuse me, that ex explanation needs to be clearly articulated on, the, on that second 325, that there's two site visits and it's size of the tree, because the size of the trees doesn't matter. It, it's really what you're talking about is administrative of staff coming out and doing all the paperwork and doing the site specific um, of the trees, correct? Through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. We will have a communications plan, but we will roll that out, and we will we will explain that in the communications plan and follow up with the public. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, before I take the vote, I just wanted to... I, I've scanned the audience here, and I didn't see any member of the audience here that wasn't, I think, part of our staff. But let me just double-check. Did I miss anybody who wished to speak? Hold on. Could you? Would you mind? Would you? Would you mind coming down here? And um, and I'm sorry. I uh, I should have asked for members of the public if they wish to delegate earlier on, and uh, as we dealt with each of the items. Is there a particular item that you wish to delegate on? And um. We could get, and thank if you. We could get your name. Megan. M e double g a n, Gardner. I am in Mr. Chisholm's uh, ward. Um, a couple of things that I were, was of concern for me looking at this on a, from a budget uh, point of view was um, I've seen a lot of construction being done on the uh, the ash trees for the emerald borers um, and I drive past um, uh, I'm on fourth line drive past uh, the bridge every day and I've seen a large section of trees that have been, just been taken down in that area. I see that um, the town is asking to spend an additional $3.8 million in removal of trees and I want to know at what stage we are in regards to removal of those trees because if this is... Uh, from what I have seen so far, we've done such a large impact of removal of those elm trees. Um, I'd like to know at what percentage of the elm trees is it still that we're we're going to be removing? You're talking about the ash, ash tree. Yes, the ash, the ash tree for the yeah. Okay, we'll get you an answer in a minute. Is there anything else that you want? To um, the only other thing that I um, I 
am concerned about is tourism as well. I do um, work uh, for the Canadian Golf Hall of Fame and Museum, and I um, so I do work in the area as well. In regards to tourism, uh, I think that it's important for town to realize that for tourism, tourism doesn't mean a Ferris wheel, an amusement park. It is people that are coming to restaurants, coming to the theater, coming and spending money in the town that don't live here. And that's what tourism is. It's not a matter of, you know, coming in and uh, staying for a long period of time. This can be short visits uh, of just a couple of hours or maybe even a couple of days. Your kids are coming for a hockey tournament. They need a place to stay. They need a place to eat. They want a place to visit, such as the Canadian Golf Hall of Fame. So I think that it's important. Um, I know that you deferred the tourism um, until December 6th that I think that that's very important for you to look at. It also is a part of it's my career as well as Oakville being where I live. So that, that's my only two comments. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Burton, you have a question. Thank you for coming. And um, I wonder if you're aware that over the last 10 years, this council has actually increased its uh, financial support for promoting tourism. And, oh, good. And... Uh, uh, and I hope you uh, heard that my interest in deferring it was to get more information to be sure that it's getting the bang for the buck that we're looking for. Absolutely. And you're okay with that? Yeah, I, I, I do know as well, though, that um, what Burlington spends on tourism and other um, municipalities is a fraction uh, of what Oakville spends. But I do appreciate the town's um, ongoing support. Any other questions of the delegate? Thank you very much, Megan. I'll Thank ask you. our staff to answer the question regarding the uh, tree removal uh, process. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of the ash removals, the roads and active parks, uh, in total we had about 8,800 trees to remove there based on our inventory. We will be completed all of that removal by the end of uh, 2016. Uh, we've started now working in our, our woodlots. We expect we've got close to 40,000 trees, ash trees that have to come down in our woodlots across the town. About 747 hectares of woodlands we have to go through over the next number of years. In Commissioner Bell's presentation, she did indicate that we have um, brought forth some efficiencies within the program, so we are actually going to be completing the bulk of the program about two years earlier. In terms of woodlots, where we're working right now, we're working in woodlots that have a 50% or greater ash component by compartment. So that means that um, we are about 25 to 30% done in terms of that 747 hectares that we have to get through. Uh, by the end of this year, will be close to uh, 240 of those hectares that will be done. So we should have everything done in terms of the woodlots by the end of 2019. Uh, barring any weather, that might get extended into the spring of 2020. But we're hoping to wrap everything up by the end of 2019. Thank you. I think that, I think that satisfies the question, Megan. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Director. Appreciate that. Um, Mayor Burton? Oh, Mayor Burton had a question for you. Actually, my question is for Commissioner Bell. But thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, Commissioner Bell, did I hear you correctly to say that despite all our adversity, we may have grown our tree canopy by 1.3 percent? Could I could I ask if you've publicized that achievement to the media yet? Are we in the process? We are actually in the process of doing a press release for the iTree report. Well, thank you very much. Very good. Any other questions? Are there any? Let me double check then. Are there any other members of the audience here who wish to provide information today? Okay, I see none. Uh, very good. Then let's move back to item number ten, which is the updated private tree protection bylaw. Uh, the item has been moved in its entirety by Mayor Burton. All those in favor? Then that is carried. Um, are there any other new items that any members of uh, the committee or any of our guest council members would like to bring forward to ask questions that aren't, haven't been covered in any way during any of the presentations or additional information that you'd like to see uh, brought forward as we go through the budget process? 
No. I have one thing that I do want to ask our staff about, and that is um, a opportunity to discuss with them opportunities to, I'll say, flatten the um, the tax impact in years going forward. Um, so if I could have um, that opportunity to work with you on that, uh, to bring something back to council, that would be appreciated. Any other items? Very good. Then uh, going forward, the, we do have two open houses being planned for the public, one on Saturday uh, morning at Glen Abbey and another one uh, down at the Central Library on Monday evening at 7 o'clock. And then we do have delegation days planned for uh, next Tuesday and next Thursday, uh, one during the morning and, uh, uh, sorry, 1 o'clock. Tuesday at 9.30, is that correct? And uh, Thursday at uh, 7 p.m., that's right. Uh, there is a Glen Abbey Rec Center, yes. Did I not say Rec Center? Rec Center. Very good. Uh, then we're adjourned, and we'll see you all at the delegation days next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Good. Good.